I'm going to perform a, a poem called uh, Antonym of, and I guess it, re it addresses um, reimagining the narrative. I guess it addresses um, thinking about uh, how in creative industries and academic industries, um, certain microaggressions can exist and, and sort of thrive. Um, and I guess calling them out and, and sort of stomping on them through my vehicle, that would be through creative practice. So uh, I'm, I'm going to share a poem with you that, um, that follows that, you know. So this one's called Antonym of. I found Clement Sieg under the A, sir. Yellow body vagrant, soggy hair wandering the plains again. I pushed my foot down on a meal. Made a shrine from a stage molded with clay and a cadence to rock the atrium. Foggy payslip, I don't see it. I don't pay artist tax. Long lost time through space and ages. I've seen death of sages. My thoughts gather miscellaneous on the page for heady exhibitions. I move through spaces practicing pomposity. I faked my university education and I was fair skinned so nobody interrogated my accreditation. Fist picking a soft row. I never posted as Caucasian, but I'm your token, aren't I? I'm the yoke of bondage. I've been fetishized, don't look me in the face, don't touch my hair, I'm kindle fire from the church and I've been set aside. Raised in a place where race relations are transatlantic slave ships. I'm an amalgamation, stuffing clouds inside my eye holes. Heavy with rain and breaking. Anarchists without the party politics, the old Zen way of not assuming labels. I made it up as I went along, just threw some words on the page and I guess it's all adjacent to my need for fame and payment. See, I don't know how to write poems, but everyone's mimicking my model, wordless waddle through time. I feel more than I admit to. It's all just useless information here that coddles my mind. See, I forgot about time and she forgot about me. I was a shell made of man and my ghost good stood free. If the antonym of mass death is the living of the few, laying lonely on the line, I hope it's not about me. Perform those rap hymns, light skin, Twitter caption, Instagram, mixed race, baby, Bible bashing, I reside in ashes. I reform in night, I remind you of darkness, don't I? My weary size are lo-fi. My philosophy is mobile. I carry around this putrid stench, strong like sticky in socks. World peace does not look like white hippies with locks. Your old centrism's a hollow hat trick. It's bigger than here, insidious fear. It's indicative to years of lies. My eyelid levies broke, body as cold as the ocean is. I'm just a sad sample of a jazz soloist, the social cyst that taught me to bury my emotions quick, alpha male to alchemist. I was renowned as the Lummox. And then I found the only way to be a man was through a woman. No, monthly cramps inside my stomach, just surrogate mother to your rap style. Tactile, the truth don't pack crowds, made alive from the background. Yellow body vagrant, free aging. I can't be an industry modification to make the playlist or conversation. Most days I don't have the attention span to write raps and I don't have a pension plan between me and you, there's a wide. See, I don't know how to write poems, but everyone's mimicking my model, wordless waddle through time. I feel you're more than I admit to. It's all just useless information here that coddles my mind. See, I forgot about time and she forgot about me. I was a shell made, a man and my ghost was the free. If the antonym of mass death is the living of the few, laying lonely on the line, I hope it's not about me. Thank you guys so much for um, for lending me your ears for that. I'll um, I'll perform uh, one more piece. Um, it's called "Contrary to the Intangible Grapevine," and this looks in a more abstract way about um, about not being ashamed to 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 stomp your own ground and 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 take back your own narrative, um, despite how. Uh, people are perceive uh, how people perceive you in industries and um, how people like to sort of try and create a certain perception of you. Um, so yeah, uh, this one's called the contrary to the intangible grapevine and it goes like this. They call the pain it takes to feel who you are necessary. To exhibit and exude what is wholly you. With the slip ups, the mishaps and the malaprops to make a ballet of the mistake, 
to paint their censorship void, they say, takes harpooning the slippery ghost or holding the two-edged sword at both ends and feeling the cut like Thomas, nursing the wound, healing and falling in love with the process, sewing your eyes closed and candy man repeating yourself away. What's with first or second nature in grossly tandem we broke the womb untamed, jagged and ugly. The straight line will beautify and purify us. Oh, if only we done learn the drive and quit drunken boxing for shadows and for laughter and patterns. Contrary to the intangible grapevine, I heard jazz at inception. Sloppy worded, disordered, uncombed still, remaining true to essence if nothing else. See, I don't fact check my mirror too often nowadays. It's been too long swallowing that spiral staircase of antagonizing self-perception, shoveling it down the gullet and praying for a punctured lung or some sort of morsel of acceptance. Now, I nurture a shrine for silence. Not in ignorance, but to hear bigger. And not in gluttony, but I guess to see clear. And still in dance, now we dance more. Family, we dance wilder. Apologies, I muted myself uh, <laughs> by accident. That was indeed the end of the poem anyway. So thank you guys so much. Um, it kind of left it on a weird anti-climax. <laughs> um, I, I hope you have a meaningful time uh, in the conference today. And I, I, I really appreciate you, Muna, for having me uh, speak those words. Otis. Thank you so much. So that was Otis Mensa, accomplished artist and Sheffield's very first poet laureate. And thank you so much for opening up the conference for us in such a beautiful, beautiful way. We do now have the technical difficulties out of the way so I can show you the program. Thank you all so much for your patience. I hope you can all see the screen. So we've got a full program for you today. We're going to be um, having a keynote by Professor Laura Sarant. We will be having a panel discussion by um, a group of in incredible black professionals who are going to be sharing their experiences of working within the workplace and tackling racism. We will be having a number of breaks as well as lunch. And in the afternoon, we will be having an update by Professor Kevin Hilton on the city's Racial Equality Commission to see where we're at so far, um, as well as having a look at what we need to do to move forward. So again, as I said, this is a solution focused and an action focused conference. So we're not just going to be talking about some of the key issues. We are going to be thinking about what we need to do as a city to move forward from here. And there will be opportunity after lunch to be a part of the breakout discussions where we'll be talking about this in a lot more detail. So. Before we start, it's really important to understand the space that we're holding. The conversations that we're having today are going to be uncomfortable and they need to be uncomfortable. Um, and so in order to maintain the space as a respectful space and a space for learning for all of us, we have to ensure that we are abiding by the same principles. And so I want us to just have a think about the principles that we're holding in the space. I, I would like us all to abide by these principles as much as possible, and there will be things that we're going to be doing throughout this, the day to make sure that these principles are upheld. So first and foremost, please be aware of the privileges that you're bringing into the space. We all have them and we all have many types of privilege. So it's just about knowing when to take a step back and so ensuring that those who are marginalized within the spaces have the opportunity to engage and lead the discussion. People will be invited to speak about their experiences of institutional and systemic racism. We have to believe their accounts and respect their vulnerabilities when they do so. It's not our responsibility or to verify, question or judge another person's experience. Be mindful of principle number one and take into account your privileges within the space. Please take care of yourself. Again, as I said, this is a triggering space. It, it will have some conversations that will be uncomfortable. If at any point you feel unsafe or you feel uncomfortable, do what you need to do in order to ensure that you are able to engage with the conversations. If you need to uh, message me privately as a host, please do so. We also have allies in the room who are helping us to monitor the chat. So if there are any challenges that you're experiencing throughout this day, please contact us. And if you do need to leave the session, you can leave and come back at any point as well using the same link. 
Maintain confidentiality and anonymity as much as you possibly can. This is a public space, so please be aware of what you're choosing to share and what you're choosing to contribute. These conversations will be recorded for the most part. The breakout so dis discussions are the only aspect of the conference that isn't going to be recorded. So just be mindful of what you're sharing and the manner in which you're sharing it. Please do continue on these conversations on social media. The hashtag is hashtag tackling racism. If you are going to tweet on, on Twitter, um, please do share the things that are happening throughout the conference, but don't share anybody's personal account. And finally, just be mindful of the language that you're using. Again, our allies are in the room that are helping us to monitor the chat. So if there is any inappropriate or offensive language that is used, you will be removed from the conference. Reflect on what you're going to say before you say it, before you say it. And if you are challenged and presented with a preferred alternative, be mindful of that and please change the language, alter the language that you're using in that moment. So the principles for the conference, just as a quick overview, be conscious of your privileges, believe the accounts and respect people's vulnerabilities, check, take care of yourself, don't share people's experiences outside without their permission and be mindful of your language. And we will revisit these principles throughout the conference as well, just so that we're all on the same page. So this conference came about through a conversation with several people across the city around the need to improve diversity at a leadership level um, in the city. One of the things that we found through those conversations is that there was a lot of focus about increasing diversity right at the very top of organizations. And the reason why there was a challenge to doing that work was because the reasons made around not being able to find diversity right at the top was that not enough people were applying for positions. We didn't have people in the city that were already in leadership roles to be able to apply for those positions and a number of other reasons that were given. The consequence of that was people were saying that it's gonna take a long-term approach in order to improve diversity and leadership. One of the things I've been in trying to encourage people in the city to consider is that in order to improve diversity and leadership, we have to improve the ways in which we're structuring our organizations across the entire pipeline and the support that we're offering people in entering into the workplace, tackling racism within workplace culture, thinking about progression and retention, as well as thinking about diversity and leadership. So it's a pipeline issue. It's not just at the very top. And those of you that were with us know that we've been trying to organize this conference since April. And we know as a city, so much has changed since then with COVID-19 and the issues that we would have been discussing in April have just been heightened and exasperated because of everything that we've been seeing over the last few months with COVID-19. And I'm sure people that are gonna be sharing their experiences today will be mentioning some of those additional consequences that we've seen over the last few months as well. So I want to start off by just thanking everybody who's able to join us today. I want to thank our sponsors. So just to acknowledge the, that there are organizations who have supported us to put this together today. Opus, who helped us to create the video as well. And James Locke and his team, thank you so much. Learn Sheffield, Sheffield Futures, Voluntary Action Sheffield, Cohesion Sheffield, and also I can't forget um, Sheffield Health and Social Care as well. So thank you so much for your financial contributions as well as your support in kind to make this possible. Thank you to the city leaders that are able to join us today. I hope you're able to stay for the full day. Um, we do have a list of people that have registered and part of the work that we're going to be doing after this conference is recognizing and acknowledging the engagement of city leaders in the work that we're doing. So as great as it is for you to be in this room listening to what we're going to be discussing, it's really important that you're a part of the conversation and that you follow through the recommendations into your organizations as well. So please stay for as much of, this, of the day as you possibly can um, and consider what you can do as a result of this within your organizations. We're now going to start with a keynote with Professor Laura Sorrent, who the introduction will give you some insight into why she is our, our keynote today. So Professor Laura Sorrent OBE is a multi-award winning global diversity and inclusive practice specialist. She's a professional speaker and experienced coach. Laura is one of BBC's expert women and was identified by the Health Service Journal among the top 50 leaders in three separate categories, 
Inspirational Women in Healthcare, BME Pioneers, and Clinical Leaders Award. She was named as the eighth most influential Black person in Britain by the Powell List 2018. And in 2018, she was an awarded an OBE for services to nursing and health policy. Laura's family are from the Commonwealth of Dominica, West Indies, and she joins us here today via Zoom. Um, Laura, over to you. I'm going to just unmute you. Great. Thank you, Muna. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. It's really good to see such a good turnout of people and, and a diversity of people turning out, which is always good and on every platform. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's always slightly off-putting, I find, when someone talks about you and you're actually in the room, um, because you kind of sit there thinking, mm, half of these people are thinking, really? And the other half are thinking, does she not have any life? When does she do all the things that other people do? So that, that, that's always good. But thank you for, for the introduction. So today, it's really about the, the essence of what today is about. Today is about the issues of racism, discrimination, and opportunity in leadership. And all those three things are part of my own identity, personally and professionally. But how we navigate those spaces and how we end up where we end up is sometimes a bit of a mystery. Often, and quite importantly, the challenges to having a much more diverse leadership are the things that are headlined. But with headlining that, we also silence the information about how people like myself who've managed to walk that line, to balance that very difficult space, have actually got to where they're going to. So I want to start us off by actually sharing with you some of the, my journey and my experiences of the highs and some of the lows of how I ended up where I've ended up. Because it's as important, certainly for us from diverse backgrounds, from us from black and minority ethnic communities, to actually hear the story of the journey, not just to see someone at the end and actually think, how did that happen? Because if we don't actually tell our stories when we have traveled these spaces, both good and bad, positive and negative. We also then sometimes contribute to silencing the view of an opportunity. And it would be a real shame for all our young people, for all our peers and for all our managers to actually only have one view of the possibility of what could be achieved or what is achieved when you walk that space of um, improvement and you walk that space of reaching your own part your own potential so that's what i want to share with you today so a lot of this presentation will be about me in fact practically all of it's about me but it really is about the importance of listening to where the silences are the voices that you don't usually hear from those voices at the margins and actually recognizing that within our journeys as leaders I've involved we, the us, and the I. So that's what I want to share with you today. So hopefully I'll be able to get the, uh, um, you need to allow me to share this, to share my screen, Mona. Okay, is that not now? Okay. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Can you give me a think, thumbs up, Muda, if you can see that? Great, okay. So my presentation today is about the we, the us, and the I, hearing the silences from the margins of experience. I am black, I am woman, and I'm leader. And in doing those three things and being those three things, I've had to manage and to walk the distance between my own personal ambition, discrimination and racism, opportunity, and also communal responsibility. They're all the things that I carry with me wherever I go and wherever I appear in my role, in my work, in my home, and in my community. So let me tell you a little bit about what it's like to walk the road that I've walked. 
I want to start by telling you a little bit about one of my heroes, Audre Lorde. And this quote by Audre Lorde from Sister Outsider, I think really represents why I think it's important to hear the positive stories and to also hear the hardships that created those positive stories of black leadership, that it actually does exist. And actually it is not always or only just in the hopes of dreams of something that might happen. And I'm speaking as much to people like myself as I am to the managers and the leaders who do not share my racial group. We've all kind of been socialized to fear more than our needs for language definition. The silences that we live in are about being afraid to show yourself, being afraid to raise your head above the parapet, being afraid of the consequences of standing out. When I listen to Audrey Lord, what I hear is the importance of speaking and of being heard. Because as she says here, sometimes it's not difference which immobilizes us from action, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. And what I'm hoping to do here is to start to reveal and bridge some of those differences between us so that we can all hear and see the possibility of what could happen if we have a much more diverse leadership in our work, but particularly if we have our own self agency about our needs on leadership. Next one. 1963, that's when I was born. I know I don't look it, but that's when I was born. Good year, I would say. These are my parents, Eudora and John Serrant. This picture of them, the one on the left, is their wedding day, which was April 1963. And that was in Lenton in Nottingham, if there's anybody here from Nottingham. And it was a grey and windy April spring day, as you can see from my mother's skirt blowing up. What you probably can't see so well from this picture is that um, she has a very voluptuous dress. And if I was to tell you that I was born in November 1963, you can probably guess why. The picture on the right, I took myself, and this is the picture of the beach, just down from the family home in Dominica, where my parents are from. So you can see that they swapped the picture on the right, sorry, to the, for the picture on the left. That is the view of a pioneer. My parents were pioneers. They, like many people from the Windrush generation before, actually came to the UK as a result of a call to come and help, to seek opportunity and to seek better opportunities for themselves and their children. I was not the first child. Behind my mother's strategically held flowers, I am the fifth of their children, but the third surviving, the first two having died of typhoid fever before the age of one in the Caribbean. So you see the story of where my start is not a story of privilege. It's not a story of living in middle-class suburbia where I live now in my very nice conservatory, but it's a typical story of most people that I know of my age who come from my background and who are black. There is nothing extraordinary about my beginnings. And this is me, age one. As you can see, I've all got my mouth open. I think I spent most of my childhood with my mouth open. I talked a lot. I think the most common thing that was ever written on my um, uh, school reports was, we wish Laura would stop talking. If she spoke less and listened more, she would learn a lot more. And what I've learned in my almost 57 years is they were probably right. Because as we see, and as I go through my journey, you'll see that what I did learn over the time was to listen a lot more than I spoke. 1986 to 1994 was seminal years for me 
they, 1986 was when I graduated from Sheffield City Polytechnic, as it was at the time, with one of the first degrees in nursing. You might think, well, degrees in nursing, they're very common. Well, yes, but actually the nursing profession didn't go all degree until 2013. But at the same time, in 1982 to 1986, Sheffield was one of the first places in the country of only a handful across the UK that actually did degree level qualifications for nurses, another type of pioneering. And through 1994, will bring you forward past my qualification and right through to when I had my second child. And I want to highlight to you why that was important. During that period of time, one of the things that struck me was I, that actually everybody didn't have the same chances. You'd kind of think that I knew that before, but I didn't. I was born and raised in the Meadows in Nottingham, which is similar to Attercliffe. It was, it was the old areas where it was heavy industry. We, su we were subject in the 1970s to what was called at the time, the slum clearance, where all the back-to-back -back terraces were knocked down and we were moved to council housing. But everybody I knew was the same. I don't mean racially, but we were all equally poor. We all had or didn't have whatever we had or we didn't have. We didn't even have a TV at the beginning. So I had no other reference point for what was to have or to have not. Like any child, I measured my position to everybody around me and everybody around me was in the same boat. So actually, although I know now as an adult that we were poor, I never felt poor because I never felt less than anybody next to me. And we lived in a very diverse area, but everybody, poverty was a leveler. The thing that did strike me was how people where I lived seemed to be sick relatively young. And as I grew up and I went through my nurse training, I recognized that actually the things that distinguished my growing up from many of my colleagues in, and my peers in the university was the levels of poverty that I lived with as my norm. In 1982, when I first started my nurse training, I read something called the Black Report, you remember. Health, everybody's business, for those people who are at least as old as me and can remember that document. And through my nurse training and my experiences, I learned that where we are born, the things that we have access to, the politics of health are all about access to resources. And alongside that, our identities and how society sees us is overlaid on that and actually allows people or enables people to think they can judge us, but also to think that they know where we will end up. And the reason I've shared this slide with you is that long ago before that, when I was about 10, I first read Animal Farm. And this phrase stuck with me, but I didn't quite understand it. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And through my training and through my nurse training and through my early years in my twenties, not only did I come to understand what that meant, but that phrase has followed me and continues to follow me in all my work. I recognize that ambition, wanting something and needing it is not always sufficient for it to be for you to have an equal chance of health or of life, that actually structurally and functionally changes have to happen because we are all in the same war, but we're all playing a different role with different equipment and different amounts of protection. When I first qualified as a nurse, I worked in gynecology and I loved it, it was great. I worked at the Jessup Hospital, the old Jessup Hospital, which is now part of the university on landing 5A, I can remember that. Loved that job. But very soon after I qualified, we started noticing something that actually many people were coming to the hospital with fear and worry about AIDS. In the mid eighties in the UK, 
HIV and AIDS, well, it was pre-HIV, we only had AIDS at that time, was a real big challenge for society. At the moment now, we're dealing with the COVID pandemic. But this was the first pandemic that I remember living and working through. And I've entitled this slide, Sex, Lies and Morality. Because working as a nurse in sexual health, actually what struck me was how people's hysteria, and I use that word specifically as I was in gynecology, people's hysteria, fear and anxiety around what they didn't understand actually had such a devastating impact on people's health and life chances. For those of you who can remember, at that time in the mid eighties, when we didn't know what caused AIDS or HIV and early death, we witnessed young people dying indiscriminately. We witnessed previously healthy people losing their lives. But even more important, we witnessed how society, and we were that society, responded to it. So my work switched from working in gynecology to specialise in, in, as an outreach worker, working with HIV and AIDS and sexual health. And in that job, I learned another message around the inequality of chance that happens. What I learned is that individual people may be respectful. Individual people may be considered and may question. But on masses, human beings can actually have a devastating effect on others. At a time when people used to bring their own glasses to the pub because they were afraid of catching something. A time when people's children wouldn't play with other people's children because they belonged to one of the five risk groups that we decided existed. At a time when people turned up for work and lost their jobs simply because people thought they had AIDS. At a time when people were refused mortgages and couldn't buy their houses and they had their tenancy agreements stopped because they belonged to certain groups. One of those groups was recognized with the racial identity around African heritage. And at that time, I witnessed that many people from my own community went to great pains to identify, I'm Caribbean, I'm not African, because they wanted to distance themselves from what they saw of as the hideous way in which people were treated. It's important in this for me that it brought to the fore the importance of having an equal chance of health and life as a basic requisite for us to be able to achieve anything. AIDS showed us how that in the quiet spaces between the headlines, people treated each other badly and that there were always then victims that were silent, that were silenced and that were not spoken to or about. And the overlaying of the things that frightened society, sexuality, race, poverty, drug use, all those groups, people that intertwined and had one common thing in common, that in the politics of health, they were least likely to be considered and least likely to have access to any resource. That's when I learned that actually it wasn't enough to be silent, to treat the individual or to support the one or two communities. That I actually had to find a way to start to speak out, to speak up and speak for those who did not have the space to speak for themselves. Now, 1994 was when my second son was born. I was a fully qualified, experienced public health nurse. I was working, as I've said, in HIV and AIDS, but obviously I also worked in community and public health as well. This is a picture of my son's back. What you might notice is a kind of bluish tinge towards the base of his back and going along his spine. Now, if we were in person, I'd, say, I'd ask you, do you know what this is? If you know what this is, I can see your faces. Can you nod? Very few people are nodding. 
Pam is nodding because I can see her nodding about that. This is what is called Mongolian blue spot. It's a birthmark that is very common in people of dark skins, very, very common. It's a bit like the old stalk mark that you get the little strawberry marks, but it, it's more common in people with dark skins. Because my, um, the father of my child was white English, his skin wasn't quite as dark as mine. And I was 30 when he was born. And as a 30 year old new mother, I had a visit from the health visitor who came, inspected my child, asked me how I was getting on. Yeah, fine, no problem at all. How are you getting on with two children? No, no problem at all. My eldest son was four and had just started uh, nursery half a day. She said, oh, right, okay. Uh, well, he seems to be putting on weight, okay. But um, I just want my, I'm, I'm relatively new. I want my supervisor to have a look at him. Okay, no problem. The next day, the health visitor returned with the supervisor. And the supervisor said to me, how are you coping with two children? Absolutely fine, thank you, no problem at all. Why? Well, it's just that my colleague has noticed some um, bruising on your son. I said, he hasn't got bruises. Oh, well, yes. Um, so she then said, would you mind if I looked at him? No, absolutely no problem. She then turned him over, as you see, and revealed and said to me, could you explain these marks on your son's back? And I looked at her and I said, yes, it's Mongolian blue spot. It's a birthmark. And she said, oh, oh, um, all right, OK. Um, would you mind if I just check that? I said, go ahead. So she phoned back to the office, asked somebody if there was such a thing, and they told her yes. And then she said to me, okay, no worries then, um, everything is fine. And she walked out of my house and they went. And I sat there for a moment and I thought, I'm a 30 year old degree educated nurse. If I had been a 17 year old, living in the meadows where I was brought up without that level of education and a single parent, how quickly would social services have been at my door because of fear of non-accidental injury to my child? Simply because somebody was trained and did not know their job. They did not know how to adapt to a diverse community that they were serving. So I went in that instance from being an experienced professional to an angry mother and an angry black mother, even worse. And that showed me that, again, all are equal, but some are more equal than others. The way in which immediately there was an assumption made, here is a black woman with two children who's not coping and her second child is obviously at risk. And I share this story with you to demonstrate that even though I was educated, I was a health professional, and I was in my own home in a very nice part of the city, I was still easily pigeonholed into a risky situation for my children. Now, which part of me being a health professional, middle class by all external views, and knowledgeable about childcare, which one of those things do you think made them think this woman is likely to be at risk to her child? And why did they not know that this birthmark is a common birthmark in what amounted to more than 25% of the population where I lived at the time. Equal chance, equal chance is the question that resigned with me. 2004, 2004 was when I finished my PhD. Now I was gonna put 2000 to 2004, but then I thought no, 2004, because that was the end of the journey. My experiences I've shared with you before around the importance of equal chance and how we, we don't all have the equal chance, that actually the structural systems with our identities and with our experiences all come together 
to decide what chance we have of good life and good health, to just give us a chance to get where we want to go. That led me to wanting to do a PhD, to understand, to actually document the things that I knew for sure from my experience, but which I couldn't find in any of the books and hadn't been discussed on any of my training so far. During my time of doing my PhD, this picture sums up how I felt. Sometimes I couldn't, because of my research was actually looking at black men, sexual behavior and risk. It was around the way in which black men, particularly black Caribbean men, were treated at the time of HIV and AIDS by people providing services. I knew from my experience of working as a nurse around HIV and AIDS that actually sometimes the black men that came into the clinic were rushed through really quickly. And whereas before we would, we would offer the system was supposed to be, you know, you have a discussion, then you take any treatment or swabs that you need or any samples, then they get another appointment to come back to the health advisor. But the black men had these all really rushed together. And when I questioned why that was, I was told, well, because we know they won't come back if we give them an appointment. We've got them through the door. They're not very good at that. So I wanted to prove that actually, is this really true? What actually happens when people try to access services? And when I was looking at that as a black woman, researching my own community, around an area of practice, sexual health, which is sensitive and which actually is sensitive on a community and an individual level, as well as on a clinical level. Often I was in this situation. In this picture, who is inside the prison and who is out? Who is outward looking in and who's inward looking out? It's difficult to tell. Because as I navigated that space and tried to make sense of the academic requirement, the personal requirements for me to tell the stories that impacted my brothers, my children, my uncles, my father, in wanting to tell their story in order that we as professionals could actually understand it and make the right decisions in the light of that knowledge, rather than despite it or pretending it doesn't happen. Sometimes I felt like I was inside and no one understood me. And other times I felt like I'm out here and this is what the reality of what is happening. I have lived this and you're looking at me from within a, a prison that you have created around your mind and your understanding. I was inside and out most of the time and I had to find a way to evidence what I knew because otherwise no one else would do it. And otherwise, the assumptions about my family and my community would continue. Through my research, I started to try to find my voice, find a way in which I could actually tell those stories. The key questions for me, and I think the key questions here for you to ask of your own organization and your own work is what counts as knowledge or evidence? Because I knew it, because it was my experience, because I lived with it, because I cared for and worked with different groups of people all the time, I knew it to be a fact. But yet when I looked in the books and the reports and the policies, the silence was deafening on these subjects. So what counts where you are as evidence? There were many times when I just found complete discrepancies between what I read as being the best practice or the best model and my own experience. In between those lines and on those pages, I, we, us, my community did not exist. The most places where I found ourselves were sometimes hidden in the numbers. So we were in the statistical reporting, but never in the narratives, in the voices and in the experiences. Statistics don't know me. They don't know of me. They have not traveled my way. They do not explain my understanding. And by no way do they represent my community and myself. They are your measure of what you believe me to be. So for me, the question is, how do I do this? How do I actually voice these things in a way that it can be heard by everybody, 
both those within my community and my family, as well as the people who have the resources that we need to make the difference. And then I was blessed to meet Elizabeth Anyongu. If any of you have never heard of her, Google her. This is her book, her autobiography, that's on the Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union. Elizabeth Anyongu was, her mother was Irish and her father's African. And this is her, you can see her on the, the top there when she got her damehood. And you also see in the central picture, Elizabeth and I worked together over 12 years with a whole host of other people collecting donations to fund and build the statue of Mary Seacole, which stands in the grounds of St. Thomas's looking across a parliament. And Elizabeth Annie Ongu at the time, she was the first nurse, she was the first person to establish the first sickle cell and thalassemia clinic in the country. Yet she was brought up in care and brought up with her mother, but her mother, but living separately from her mother and her father, who were both Cambridge first year students, he African, she Irish. Elizabeth in a mid seventies now. I hope I've got that right or she will be very angry with me. She's in her seventies now. And so at that time, you can imagine the challenges she herself faced in that. Now, the reason I count myself blessed to meet her as my mentor and now my friend is, she was the first person who said to me, Laura, these stories that you want to tell have value. They are valuable because they are yours. They are valuable because they are that of many, many people. And you have a privilege and a responsibility to tell those stories and find a way to give that voice so their voices can be heard. Because if you don't do it, who else will? So she was the one that encouraged me to continue to write, to speak and to reveal silence. And so I bring myself to Audrey Lord again, because when I met with Elizabeth, I started to think, what happens if I do that? What's the risk to me? I've managed so far to navigate quite cleverly and without much personal damage, the space between professional and personal, keeping those two things separate. When I did my PhD work, working within my own community, I realized that those things were never separate, that they were always together. And that actually, what would be the worst that could happen if I started to speak the truth? that I knew to be true, even if the policy and the models and the paperwork didn't record it. So I began to ask myself each time, what's the worst that could happen to me if I tell this truth? Unlike other women in, in, women in other countries, our break in silence is unlikely to have us jailed, disappeared or run off the road at night. Our speaking out will irritate some people get us called bitchy or hypersensitive and probably disrupt some dinner parties. And then our speaking out will permit other women to speak until laws are changed and lives are saved and the world is altered forever. So next time, ask yourself, what's the worst that will happen? And then push yourself a little further than you've dared. Once you start to speak, people will yell at you, they'll interrupt you, They'll put you down and suggest it's personal and the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and easier. Once I had read that, I had the strength to go forward. At the end of my PhD, I actually came up with a, a subject or a concept called screaming silences. And that's for another presentation. But screaming silences are my way of speaking about experiences which are historically or politically undervalued, absent or invisible. And while we continue then to develop without exploring or including those experiences, what happens is that without that evidence, we end up with policy or practice and care developed in silence, continuing to silence the needs or even the existence of people that we don't usually account for. 2018. 2018 was a seminal year for me as a nurse and many people. 
The biggest headline in 2018 was 70 years since the NHS was put together by Anwar and Bevan in 1948. There were big celebrations. But those 70 years also coincided with 70 years of the arrival of the Empire Windrush. That's no coincidence. Those of you who know your history, as we sit here in Black History Month, those of you who know your history will know that the NHS within a month of launch was woefully short of staff. They did not have enough qualified staff or experienced staff to actually keep the NHS going. So out went the call to the Commonwealth countries and the former colony countries for people to come and help to save the NHS and the rest of the system. Without the influx of those migrant, the migrants from the Windrush generation from across all the continents, the NHS that have saved us in this pandemic would not exist. The NHS that we love is built on and is dependent on the input and the contributions of people from across the world, without which it would never have survived. So 70 years and counting is where we are. So 70 years and counting is where our structures and our changing times require us to understand that even the very structural part of our foundations that we hold so dear, that at the moment we hear in the rhetoric, we got to save from being overrun, is built on the legacy, the memory and the resilience of the very people that the headliners are trying to exclude. Legacy, memory and resilience are the three elements that reflect the contributions of the diverse communities that we have here today in our country, in our communities and in our families. But I wanna challenge a little bit sometimes the think feeling that we talk about resilience at the moment, particularly with COVID and all the challenges we've had, we talk about resilience as it is in this picture. We talk about being able to keep going despite juggling all the plates, beside the pressures from all sides, and beside sometimes feeling that you're so overwhelmed that you're at the bottom of a deep pit. The resilience of workers, of communities, of individuals and family, this is the picture of resilience that we present. And it's also often the picture of resilience that we present to talk about what it takes to succeed as a black person or to succeed as a minority ethnic person or to succeed as a woman or to succeed as a gay man or LGBTQ person, all these things. This is the picture that we constantly and only present to people. And it's an important picture because it is a reality but we also need to recognize that it is not the only outcome, the only picture that there is. And that if we continue to only present this picture and only let people see the failures, the pressures that did not quite get theirs, that we actually start to paint a picture that this is the only outcome that is possible, which is only a very small step from saying, well, what's the point of doing anything if this is what happens? For every step back we get pushed, there are two or three steps forward. And we have to recognize both elements. We talk about resilience and we talk about weathering and weathering very much and microaggressions as the way it wears away and creates a, us to be different, to be worn down, to be less than. But in nature, as in experience, weathering also produces fabulous outcomes. This is Durdle Door for those of you, I took this picture. And Durdle Door is the result of weathering in the natural world, the wearing away of the landscape. But in the process, we don't, what we shouldn't lose sight of is what is created within that process. In COVID-19 at the moment, we are weathered by the isolation. We are weathered by not being able to see our friends and family. We are weathered by the negative press and the news that we hear. We are weathered here in Sheffield, certainly by the threat of further lockdown. But in that silence, 
and the weathering. We've heard the birds singing. In that silence and weathering, we've probably contacted more people than we would normally do, if not even if it's virtually. In that weathering, our air is cleaner. But also in that weathering, we've heard and seen how unequally our resources are distributed within the city. So silence reveals the good and the bad. And our view is to make sure, our responsibility is to make sure that we hear and see both. And we don't lose sight of the gains in the process by only focusing on the, the lack or, the, or the, um, what's missing in the end result. Weathering does both, move us forward and backwards, but it does change us. And we have to grasp what is positive in that change and not be fearful of it. Muna mentioned that in 2018, I was named in the power list um, at number eight. My claim to fame, by the way, is that the, you know, the head of Vogue, well, my daughter does design and the head of Vogue was number 10. And that to her was my best achievement. Never mind, forget your PhD and everything else, mother. You, you know, as a designer, you came above the man from Vogue. Blessings to him anyway. But the person who came at number one was Gina Miller. Nod your head if you remember Gina Miller. Gina Miller was the woman who challenged the government. Can you remember way back when we were still talking about the beginning of Brexit? And she challenged them. And when she took her uh, award on the day for coming, becoming number one, she was asked a question and that they asked her, was she not afraid to stand up as a woman? Certainly if you've heard of all the backlash that she got on the negative backlash on social media and et cetera, was she not afraid to stand up and put her head up and speak about things that people did not want to speak about. And she said, I do what I do because I'm fearful, not because I'm fearless. And that really struck me again. And her words identically echo the reason I do and I speak of the things I speak of in the places I speak of. Because I'm fearful that if I don't, who else is going to say it? I'm fearful if I don't, that I may well be the only person from my community or with my experience who has the chance to say something. And if I don't speak, all those people who are, can't be seen will have no voice. I do what I do because I'm fearful of what happens if I do not do it. I'm fearful of a world in which we have no role models of black achievement, in which we, as we assume and accumulate stories of failure and no stories of achievement or positivity, where we have no hope in a different outcome because we have no way of seeing that or actually thinking what that might look like. I'm fearful of inaction. I'm fearful of no examples. I'm fearful of one story that paints a single truth of our experiences. So, as I come towards the end, what's, what I've learned in my 37 years post-qualification, my 57 years on this planet, is that silences, the things that we don't always hear or talk about are there all the time. They're not created by pandemics like HIV and AIDS. They're not created by COVID. COVID hasn't created anything. All it's done is given a space to reveal so we can hear the noises that were there in our society anyway. And it challenges us to not only hear those noises, but to do something about it. I've learned that it's important for me to speak. So the one-year-old and the school child is still speaking, but I'm also now listening because it's important to check that what you are saying is being heard. And it's important that if you are listening to somebody speaking, they are actually hearing what is being said. And to my friends, my colleagues, my peers, my community, black, minority, Asian community, I speak to you to say, listen to the voices within you and the silences within you. 
silencers for everybody are within as much as they are within the structures and the systems. If we only pay attention to the external, we miss the most important part of experience, which is in here. So I want to finish by reading to you part of one of my unpublished poems. I write poetry because it helps me to speak. And this is one about silences within, because I wanted to bring it back to the eye. And I want to just summarize for you, some of these sentences hopefully will resonate with you, but they summarize for me the journey I've been on in my 37 years and 57 counting. And what happened when I actually harnessed my own silence and actually listened to my own voice to help me decide what I should say and when I should be quiet. When I heard my own silence, I forgave myself for staying. When I heard my own silence, I took a deep breath and I whispered, you're okay. When I heard my own silence, I remembered my worth. When I heard my own silence, I stopped saying yes, when I really meant no. When I heard my own silence, I knew it was not my fault. When I heard my own silence, I realized my own strength. When I heard my own silence, I found my voice and began to speak of my pain. When I heard my own silence, I heard the voices of the ancestors speaking from within me. When I heard my own silence, I exhaled and it felt good. I am black, I am woman, I am leader. Thank you for your time. Laura, thank you so much. Um, there are no words, just Thank you for helping us to situate and contextualize the, the conversations that we're going to be having today. When people saw the title of it being Tackling Racism Across the Leadership Pipeline, I think immediately people's assumptions were around we're talking about the system, but within the system are people. And so in today's conference, it really is about bringing in the voices that are left at the margins bringing in the voices that are often invisible in the spaces that we occupy, bringing in the voices that are often silenced. And so we are centering those voices today. We will be talking about the impact of the system. We will be talking about the data, what we have and what is missing. And we will be talking about what needs to change. But at the heart of everything that we're discussing today, it's the people. And what we need to do as individuals and the collective responsibility we need to have as a city to make Sheffield the city that it needs to be. I'm opening the floor now to questions for Laura. So please, before I do, I just want to remind you of the principles so that we're all aware of what we need to do in this moment. So as I said earlier on, as you are asking the questions, please aware, be aware of your privileges. Take into account that people will be sharing accounts if they do choose to share their accounts and to respect that. Take care of yourself throughout the conference. Don't share the experiences that people are sharing in these moments on social media or elsewhere um, without their express permission and please be mindful of your language. I will also say that this part of the session is also being recorded so if you do want to ask Laura a question just be mindful of the fact that it is being recorded so if you want to take turn your camera off when you're doing so then you're welcome to do that as well. If you do have a question please use the raise hand function and I will unmute you so you can ask Laura. Yep Dave I'll unmute you. Oh, one second. There you go. Yeah, yeah um, Laura, um, fantastic speech. I really appreciate you taking time out to share your experience. I'm just wondering what made you leave Nottingham, you won Nottingham to come to Sheffield because Nottingham's a pretty liberal place as well. 
What made you invest your time and energy in Sheffield? What did you see? Um, I, I came to Sheffield first when I did my training. I, I was at home um, and I went back to Nottingham since. I um, was at home, born, raised in Nottingham. And then um, I came to the Polytechnic, as I said, in Sheffield to do nurse training, um, to do my degree in um, 1982. They didn't do the nursing, they do now, but they didn't do the nursing degree in Nottingham. And also, I was a child, that was a way of leaving home without getting having to have a big talk about it. <laughs> right. how, how did you find it? When you came to Sheffield initially, how did you find the people in Sheffield? Because I, I do like Nottingham as well, but how do you find Sheffield different from Nottingham in terms of their attitudes towards you as a black person? Um, I, 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 I don't have... I think I have a different life in Sheffield because Nottingham's my hometown. A lot of my family and friends and, you know, I live there. So um, I stayed in Sheffield for 10 years after, from 82. And then I went back to Nottingham. I was in Nottingham then for another kind of 10 years or so. And I've also lived in Birmingham and different places. Um, but in Sheffield is very much, um, I don't really have family in Sheffield. So Sheffield for me is my, my grown up city, if you like. It's where I, my, where I work professionally. I've got friends that I've made and I've known for a long time. But when I go to Nottingham, it's home. So the, the circles I move in in Nottingham, are actually more family and friends, if you know what I mean, rather than in a professional sense. Um, yeah. What I would say is that when I'm in Sheffield, and it may be because I'm not networked in the community so much, I've got friends and people I know, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't grow up here, is that people hear me <coughs> speak, and they think, they, they try and work out where I came from. They assume that I've come from, you know, a silver spoon background or whatever. So they, they react to me slightly differently. Um, and most people who know me from Sheffield, I know me usually professionally through my work. I came back to work at Hallam and I've worked within the health system here. So um, I just have a different, it's, it feels a different platform for me, Sheffield. Although this is home, I live here and I've lived okay. here for quite a long time. Okay. Thank you. And then Khartoum, welcome to you. Long time no see. Oh, I was just about to say that. So great to see you. Gosh, um, <laughs> Now, I want to say 10 years, so that means probably about 20, is it? <laughs> it it's about 15, and I was quite excited um, that you were the keynote speaker. But when I first came to Sheffield and I met you and Gina, uh, both professors now, uh, Gina Higginbottom, I was absolutely inspired. As uh, I, I, fa I found that I actually, I grew up in London, and then I come to the north, and then I meet you two, and I was like really inspired in what you were doing and obviously dealing with all the issues of uh, health visitor issues to uh, tackling the health inequality of our community. So I just wanted to say, great to see you and thank you for doing this today because we need that kind of support and, and it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Laura. Lovely to see you. It's always great when you meet, you know, I won't say old faces, but faces from the past and you, you meet people in different uh, situations. You always have to, for me, I've always had to be a bit careful about that because years ago when I worked in sexual health, I was always like, have I seen you in a clinic or is it, you know, have we met somewhere else? So it was always, I always waited for someone else to say where they met me. It was all very, very delicate. Yeah. Because I wear a different hat now. I think people around here know me as a different kind of title. But my, my experience in, in Sheffield 15 years ago was in working in health inequalities with it was Dina, yeah which is why i met you so brilliant yeah. to see you again brilliant. thank you so much Colton. and then we have uh paul hi laura that was um truly inspiring so thanks ever so much um I, one of the things i'm always looking for is is other really organizations where there's been really good examples of leadership so i just wondered if you if you know of any or if you could share any great I know any organizations where there's been good examples of leadership um i think um i think what i would say is it's not so much uh, probably the it's not so much the organization well it is i suppose um the person i would hold up as the best example of the leadership that not only supports but champions and with positive action promotes and has achieved um, diversity 
diversity, diversity informed and diversity inspired and diversity um, driven inclusive leadership is John Buddha, who's not, who's a white man. In, and he worked, I think he's just moved, but he was at um, one of the London hospital trusts. Um, I'll, have to, I'll find out which one, that, it's gone out of my head. Um, but in that trust, he actually, and he actively put in systems processes to include and to promote the diversity within the trust at every level, supporting different groups and diversity across the piece, but particularly around racial diversity and racial discrimination. Absolutely zero tolerance at every level since he's been there. Um, and um, also the way in which the board is constructed, the way in which um, they use all the systems, not just the, you know, the, the shiny things like reverse mentoring, the actual um, people having much more confidence and agency to drive their position, career opportunities, not just raise going up a ladder, but actually being able to diversify across spaces, if you wish. Um, and he's definitely, for me, and the person who definitely walks the walk and talks the talk and is has the highest is highly respected by um the 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 people who work with him from all communities but particularly from my work i've, I've linked with them around um you know kind of racial racial equality and racial racism work so john buddha is the person so i i think the organize I, I name him rather than name the organization because the organization is excellent, but because it's because of the way he's actually implemented his leadership. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. And then we've got Ian. So Ian, I'll just maybe you. Thanks, that was fantastic. Um really great. Uh, I, I work at Hallam. Um and uh, in fact I joined Hallam while you were in the midst Did you join when I left? <laughs> in the nursing degree you were doing your nursing degree i'm not old um and but uh i work in housing and i chair south yorkshire housing association my question is really actually just on that i'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on comparing the education opportunities uh, that were open or perhaps closed to you um when you arrived at sheffield city, uh, city polytechnic compared to the opportunities for your children now uh, educationally uh, what change has there been and has it been for the better or the worse um i i was just trying to think i apply i didn't really have i'm just well i wasn't conscious of opportunities being close to me i was in the last year where we did the 11 plus so I did the because my sister's a year younger than me. She didn't have to do the eleven plus. That's why I knew I was in the last year. So we did the eleven plus at school, um, and then uh, we had uh, we. I was supposed to, much to my horror, go to the grammar school because I passed the eleven plus. I didn't even realise I was sitting in the exam. I just thought it was some work we had to do. So um, and my parents had no idea about it either. We just literally, you've got to go here, sit at this desk, and do this test. So we did it, and I was supposed to go to the grammar school, which I did not want to go to. Uh, it was the Loretto Convent Grammar School in Nottingham. Um, and the reason I didn't want to go there is because all my, my elder brothers and all my cousins all went to the, you know, the, the kind of the, the technical school. Um, but luckily for me, 1975 was a great year where we went fully comprehensive in Nottingham. So in the summer holidays, suddenly I was released from the burden of having to go to the grammar school and wear white gloves, which was and a straw boater in the summer, um, to actually be able to go to the comprehensive. And I just found school easy. I, I found learning easy and I enjoyed it. And I was at a school that was very, it, it, it was a, a Catholic school, but it was very uh, mixed in terms of diversity, most of my brothers, my cousins, most of my family went to the same school. So I suppose I had like a, almost a, a group, if you like, of people all together. And the, the majority of the uh, non-black students that were in the school were um, Irish and very, very staunch Irish backgrounds. So that was my big, so for me, when I went to go to university, it was really about you've passed the exam, what do you wanna do? I did my A-levels, I did my GCSEs and well, the O-levels, I'm trying to make myself younger now. I did my um, O-levels, did my A-levels, applied for university and got offered four places. Um, and actually, um, the reason I went to Sheffield to do the course 
unbelievably instead of Leeds my last my two choices were between Leeds and Sheffield Leeds um Polytechnic or Sheffield City Polytechnic and I went to Leeds I went to Leeds for my interview and it poured with rain and I went to, the day I went to Sheffield it was sunny and on that basis was my future cast <laughs> I, you know it probably wasn't sunny another day for the whole four years I was there but that was the reason I chose it but my 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 three children um two have gone to university and one hasn't gone to university um but again I think it was different for them because I had I was, you know, I was a professor by the time they had, they were applying for university and I knew the system. So it was, I could help them navigate that system really well. So I don't believe, I believe that other students, other um, BME students that I have supported have had to have lots more support to get in and to make the right choices and supporting other friends and relatives and neighbors because they, because their parents hadn't navigated that system. But my children, I think, were, were privileged in, in that sphere because I knew how the system worked. So I think that their opportunity was greater because of my knowledge of the system rather than my experience where my parents both left school, you know, before they were 13. Um, I went to all my interviews on my own. They just put me on the train. They had no idea where I was going or what happened. I came back and went, how did it go? I filled in my UCAS form, did everything, and that was it. They had... You know, and I was the first in my family to go to university, so there was no precedent set. Thank you. That probably doesn't answer your question, but that kind of just gives it that context, really. Yeah, sure. Thank what you. I do think, though, is where I work at the moment now, I'm head of nursing at Manchester Met University, which we've all seen on the news. Anyway, um, and that what one of the things that we have in place that I think works really well that I support is that we have a first generation scheme. So they have a scheme for um, any students who are gonna be the first in their, like I was the first generation to go to university. And what happens is we identify them on application. And then from through the summer, we have, it's almost like a summer club thing that we have um, not just to, to link them with other people who might be first new to university, but also through the first year, we have activities like socialization into university and, and, and orientation from them alongside just so to actually get used to that, that environment. And, and it really works really well to, and when we have, it works really well to help them integrate into a university thing, which is often completely alien to them or their families. And I think that would scheme would work really well in other spheres. It's not an education thing. I think in other organisations, if if you're taking on people um, either from from a diverse backgrounds in a whole range of groups, um, and particularly um, children who may be coming out of care, for example, in, and who've done really well and who are working well and are ambitious, that there's something about their socialisation into your workspace, into that learning space, where they don't you, you can't assume that they know how things work. You know, so very much like I had in some of my nursing experience where my personal experiences and the things that are in your handbooks and the things that are given on your briefing bear no resemblance to anything that you actually recognize. You know, it's how do we help people to 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 not not mind the gap, but see the gap and actually be able to get over it. Absolutely. Laura, thank you so much. We could we could go on. Um, for ages but I know that we've got to have a break now so we'll be having a 10 minute break if you do want to catch up with any of Laura's work and please get in touch with her um, these are her social media details as well as her email so please take a look at that we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll resume at 11 40. Uh, Mona if I can just say I know a few yeah. people saw in the chat said about um, they wanted um, um, could they have a script of the poem or whatever mm -hmm. um, and actually, I have a podcast, which is not on there, but the poem will be coming up. I will be putting, I will be putting up on my podcast, me reciting it, and obviously people can access it there. Mm -hmm. And then it will be, you'll be able to pick up the link to it on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. And then I'll, I'll probably write it up on my, um, on my uh, LinkedIn site or somewhere, but I will let you know where you can pick it up. But um, I tend to publish them on my sites first, and then you can access them after that. So once I've done it, I can actually write it out and send it as a link to share, but you will be able to access it probably quicker on social media. Brilliant. And once you send it through, we'll definitely circulate it and make sure everybody has access to that as well. And also just to say that because it's been the the the, the event is being recorded, you'll be able to catch the keynote as well as Otis's um, 
presentation at the beginning of the session um, later on if you've missed any part of it by having to dip in and out so don't worry so we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at 11 40 to listen to the panel discussion thank you all thank you all thank you i'm born i'm born in burn grief um a long long time ago i'm one of eight children i um attended the local um comprehensive school eindhouse um I then left school after doing my A-levels and started the world of work. I've, I've worked basically since 1979 and in 1986, I started my own business working for myself. And I've, I'm still doing that today, running a successful business. And I just want to share the experiences that I've uh, come across in terms of what the barriers are. And one of the things when I'm in private sector, in the private sector, is whenever I come in most organisations, I very, very rarely see anyone who looks like me. And that's, a, that's not just in Sheffield, but we're talking about Sheffield. And the reasons for that is because I think the leadership of um, these institutions don't, there, there's no pipeline in towards getting young people into these organisations. No support, no pipeline. So if there's no pipeline, how on earth can people become leaders? You know, they feel they're not supported in organizations, I, I, don't, I believe. And so it's really disheartening for a young person at 19, 20, I haven't done all the exams, I haven't done all the study to never see anyone who looks like them, you know? And so that's one of the main reasons as I was working in my working life, why I decided very early on to not work in organizations. It's because I could not see anyone at all in the seven years that I worked as a representative for the company who would look like me. So I thought to myself, if there's, if there's no reason, if, if I can't see anyone who looks like me, why am I going to organizations? It doesn't make any sense. So, so that's where I started. So I just believe that when, you, when, I see, when I do see people of color, I don't like the term Bane, by the way, so I don't use it very often. Mm -hmm. so, so you, don't, <laughs> you don't get me using that term very often. I don't like that. It's, it's, it's a term that's been forced upon us and I don't really like it. So I'm, I'm Dave Campbell, I'm a black guy from Sheffield, from Pittsmore, yeah. that's me, okay? And so, so, so when I see um, people in, in organizations, black people, people of color in organizations, I actually wonder what their life is like because to be the only one or a very few up against all the kind of issues that they encounter and they, and they do encounter these issues as well. I mean, I played football in, in an all white team. I was the first player to play football in an all white team. So I know about isolation. But when I played football, my job, I saw it as my job to integrate that team. And by the time I left after eight successful years, the team was half and half. And I consider that to be my greatest achievement rather than the medals that I won, yeah? And we were the most successful non-professional team in Sheffield and South Yorkshire, Arbathorn EA. And so to me, nothing matters more than inclusion and equal opportunities. It doesn't matter how good people say they are at their jobs. If, if it doesn't represent the society that, that they, they are from, I don't really take much notice because I see what happens to young people from my background when they are marginalized and not included in, 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 at every level. You know, so I remember having conversations with Bob Kersley years ago about this kind of thing. And, and I remember going to the council and I realized that the, I, the, the ladders I went, the less people I saw looked like me. And I would ask him, I would ask him why? When I understood that how to run an organization, but I would always tell him that, Bob, look, I know where I'd be in your organization. I'd be somewhere in middle management when yet here I am running my own business with 50 staff. So, so, so the barriers are pipelines, the barriers are equal opportunities, the barriers are not being the kind of people who want to be going to the pub. I don't want to go to the pub every night, you know? I, don't, should, I should not need to go to the pub every night or the golf club or skiing to be worthy of my role within an organization. OK, so so these are the sorts of micro things that take place, which people of color or black people within organizations feel isolated. They, they may not say it, they may not speak about it, but believe you me, these are the, some, some, some of the issues. I'm not saying all of them. And I, and I would dare anyone to say different because I speak to people all the time. My job is for the last 35 years 
is to is to converse with people each and every day about what's going on in their workplaces. And so for me, I don't. The only time I come up against these these leadership issues are when I butt up against organisations, theatres, colleges, schools, restaurant groups, nursing operators, um, shopping complexes, golf clubs, sports facilities. I never see anyone in the top tier who look like me. And this is a real problem for me when, when I know we are capable. I've, I am proven. By the way, I have many friends who are capable as well and they do okay. But I'm talking about taking the leadership roles. I'm talking about being in charge of policies, being in charge of finance, being in charge of making decisions, not going to a board of 20 people and being the lone voice. These are the barriers that I think present themselves in Sheffield, the fourth biggest city in England, the fourth biggest city in England. Yet when I look around and I go everywhere, I, I don't see people like me. We're in the fourth biggest city in England. It doesn't make any sense. So something is going on. Mm -hmm. We all know what it is, whether we call it out or not. I'm not, I don't blame people because the, the, the system that I created, there are, there are invisible walls. And all people are, I call them gatekeepers to a system, yeah, that excludes people like me. And the only way you can see it is when you look at the top table. You look at the top table and see who's represented. And what you see are people who are not like me. I'm not saying we should be all over the top table. I'm saying there should be a fair representation of people like me. And when that happens, all the resources that follow down, you'll see them follow down to the right people in the right places. And that's what will happen. And it won't happen until that top table starts to look really clearly at themselves. It doesn't matter which organization it is. I'm not naming names because that's irrelevant, but they, they all know they are. Look at your top table and see who's represented. That's all you need to do. Sorry, Mood, I, I crack on a bit sometimes. No, Dave, thank you so much. And it's, and it's evidenced in the data. We know that over 20% of the population in the city are people of color. That's one in every five people, but yet the data shows us that less than 4% of decision making in the city involves people of colour. And yeah. so everything that you're saying isn't anecdotal evidence. It's, it's there and it's clear for all of us to see. And it's one of the things that we really need to be addressing in the city. Thank you so much. Lindy, Anne, did you want to comment on that question as well? Yeah, I think um, about 15 things I could as um, David was speaking, because for me, I don't know, you can tell that my really strong Sheffy laughs and that my initial um, experience in education and, and the professional life wasn't in Sheffield, even though I consider it my home. And I would say at the top of that, that lack of racial diversity, even within a majority of um, what you would call minoritized people in the UK, but the global majority, was about patriarchy and whiteness. So that even though, David, I would say that the top table have people that look like us, it doesn't necessarily mean it's racially diverse. And Pretty Patel and Rishi Sunak are examples of what I'm trying to yeah. say, if you know what I mean. That sometimes whiteness overpowers the opportunities that we have. And I think the, the, the quote that I said is that once patriarchy gets into that boardroom and whiteness gets into that boardroom, there isn't any room for anybody else. There isn't. I had this um, dream, you know, this waking dream this morning that this long corridor with doors and as you are as a person from minorities background trying to get up that ladder, you have, you know, all these different things coming out of doorways and just pulling you back and, and you know, stopping, as you said, David, that pipeline. And I felt like, um, again, research based that there seemed to be a fundamental belief that people of African descent in particular and minoritized people from minor, minoritized backgrounds in general don't have the ability to lead. And I think that's where we have that pipeline issue. But if I don't have anybody who actually puts me as a face that's supposed to be at that table, other than uh, for a token, then there's no way that other than, um, and I see it in the, in the job that I have now, and my job is to tackle racism in the workplace. My job is to develop um, staff capability around race and racism. And after three years, it's finally the opportunity for people to actually start to understand what anti-racism is. After three years, it's taken that time for people to start thinking, 
to start questioning why boardrooms look so, um, you know, one mono monocolored. So I think, and the third thing I think, and I, again, reflecting on my own journey, at one point I got lost in the system. I got lost in, in just trying to, um, you know, that, that dichotomy of fearful, fearless, and, this, um, and of being visible just wanting to just, all right, I'm just going to keep going on. And I can say that this country did that to me because I wasn't like that, you know, within um, in professional life here. So I started to start to doubt myself. I started to remain silent. And I love that um, Laura used Audrey Lord this morning. So when, you know, I discovered when I was doing my um, doctoral studies and she talks about it is we were never meant to speak so it's better to speak than remain mm -hmm. silent and and that is something that has really governed what I do and if, and that flip and that's why one of the things I, I, I encourage is mentoring young people feeding them people from minoritized groups to make sure that as again Laura said that we are able to support the next generation and, and develop our own pipeline because nobody else is going to do it for us so we need to feed uh, the people that look like us, but we also need to address the needs of um, other groups around us that are part of the structure. So that would be my um, contribution in terms of, you know, positioning people that look like us as, as holders of knowledge of understanding how patriarchy and whiteness works to circumvent what we do and how, res how important resistance is and how we must always keep that check on ourselves and not remain silent. Lindia, thank you so much. And, and adding to that question, but also building on it, there's another question in around white privilege and what the, is the role of white privilege in, in ensuring that leadership remains as it is and isn't as racially diverse as it needs to be in order to represent the city. So uh, Rob, can I ask you to come in for that question? I know you've got a lot of thoughts on this topic, that's why. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, what is the role? Um, but first of all, I'll just do what, what, what Dave did. I'll just give a, a, a quick background. Um, I'm born and raised in Sheffield. I'm not as old as Dave, but you can all tell that. <laughs> um, I'm born and raised in Sheffield in 1960. I was born in Netheredge. Um, I grew up from around one years old to eight years old in, in Attercliffe when there were houses there. It's now part of the Pitts uh, uh, soccer ground. That's, uh, they were housed on near Westbury Street. Um, what's now the Pakistani Muslim Centre was my old primary school. Um, up to almost nine years old, I had no concept, no ideas on, on race and difference. We were just children and families that just did things together, you know, across the street with neighbours, etc. When I moved to Parson Cross in 1969, well, that was a, a real rude awakening. Uh, let, let's say, uh, um, for anybody who knows Sheffield, who's from Sheffield, you know, Parson Cross, uh, it's a tough place. Um, I grew up from nine years old there to leave home at 25 and I moved to Pittsmore. I went to Chaucer School and at school, I, I was barely an also ran. Uh, I, I left school with uh, most, I can see most people will know what, remember what CSEs are, there were even GCSEs those days, Mona. But, um, you know, I, I left school with three, three threes, a four and a five, four in English, five in maths. Um, and we're just written off. I was just steel worker, fodder. That's what I was. My dad worked in the steelworks, so I was assessed to be a steel worker. And I went into engineering. Um, bummed around for, for a while and forgot about education. I just thought that that part of my life had just passed. And then got into my late 20s and I started to, you know, return to education, got my first degree at 33 from Hallam, started at the Polytechnic like Laura, but finished at Hallam. And then I got a master's degree in uh, 2001 uh, uh, from University of Warwick. And it, 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 like for many of us, it, it's, it's been quite an interesting journey. And all, the, the thing that I studied at, at, at uh, University of Warwick was on whiteness. And not, not so much about, a lot of people think when you talk about whiteness, they talk about white people. Well, actually you're not. Whiteness is about an attitude. It's about the way that we think. It's the way that, that we've been taught to think and what informs that thinking. And that's what I was interested in. 
because I got, you know, I, um, I work with Janet there. It says, uh, it says Sarah Story. There's two of you called Sarah Story, by the way. <laughs> uh, but I, I worked with uh, uh, Janet in, in, in probation uh, for quite a good number of years. Um, and I, I've gone through quite a lot of uh, um, anti-racism training. And although I said it was a joke right at the beginning for those that <laughs> were online, um, that kind of silence was what we experienced in anti-racism training until either the trainer spoke or a, a black colleague spoke. Um, and, and that's what it was like. And I, and I thought to myself, how useful is this in trying to address some very, very serious issues? Because in an organization like probation service, when the institutional racism is evident, it means people that look like Dave, Jonathan and me, it means we go to prison. That's what racism looks like in, uh, in, in probation. It means that we don't get community orders because I don't know, I'll just say as, as I think it is, is that some white staff don't want to work in close proximity with black men because we're seen as scary. We start getting scared from about 13 years old up until 13 where we could the little things, well, until Tony Blair changed the age of criminality down to 10 years old. But, you know, that's what racism looks like. And I thought, well, if racism is really this important and it has this kind of impact, how can we sit there in silence when we're trying to be introduced to a subject that will hopefully not only just change our thinking, but more importantly, change our practices. And so I got bored and fed up with the anti-racism training. I was at right at the beginning of my career in the early 20s. I was in the, you know, uh, the rat training, race, away, uh, race awareness training, which was quite scary for a lot of people. And I started thinking to myself, well, how can we make this very important piece of work more approachable to people? So instead of looking at, you know, uh, my white colleagues are saying, you know, uh, and helping them to not to be racist, it was about us trying to learn what informs our thinking. What makes someone racist, sexist, disabled, whatever the issue is. But for here, what makes people racist? And if you ask that question, people don't know. And you, you get a similar response to if you ask uh, white people, what is it to be white? What is it? It's, it's a difficult question, I appreciate. Uh, uh, but they're, they're, they're difficult answers because they're not things that we really think about. People are racist, but they don't really think about why they are racist. I'm not bothered about your Tommy Robinsons because, you know, um. and his little followers, of which there were many thousands uh, in, in Sheffield, uh, when he came to Sheffield uh, a few years ago. Uh, some people I went to school with was on his, on his rally. I thought, oh, interesting. <laughs> um, what does bother me, though, are, are people uh, in institutions like probation, police, education, town hall, NHS, wherever, uh, and, and including private institutions as well. But those are the racists that, con that, that, um, that concern me because those are supposed to be the educated ones. We're supposed to be educated, you know, probation service is a very highly educated uh, um, organisation per individual. Um, but there's some very clever racists there as well. And that's one of the things that concerned me. So I looked at whiteness um, as an alternative approach, if you like, to looking at anti-racism things. So we could start to think about what informs our thinking. And what informs our thinking, of course, is the media, you know, social media, newspapers, uh, education systems, uh, employment practices, but they're just things that we just accept. We don't really think about it. And so in, in, in looking and trying to prepare for some of this today, uh, um, people, uh, 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 Mona, I think we've really got to start asking ourselves some real difficult questions. And that's why you, you said earlier, you know, this is now the time for us all to start feeling comfortable or, or un uncomfortable because it's an uncomfortable subject. We've tried this softly, softly approach I don't know what it is in Sheffield, but you know, um, I, I like Sheffield. I won't live in another city in England. If I leave Sheffield, I'll, I'll leave the country. Um, I do like Sheffield, but there's something here in Sheffield um, which is strange. I don't know if it's something in the water. I don't know. 
the water's quite good. It's better than London water, but we drink a lot. I don't know what it is, but you know, not that I want us to burn down our city and our buildings, because I don't. But when the riots came in the 80s, London, Bristol, Birmingham, Nottingham, Manchester, everybody said Sheffield next. We didn't like a match. In the 90s, London, Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, nothing in Sheffield. In the, in the 2011, I think last time, same again. I don't know what it is. As I say, I don't want people to, to, to burn anything down here, but we have got to shake something up in this city. We've got to create something that we haven't done before. And it, it, it's got to result in, in us not needing uh, uh, the incredible amount of work that Dr. Abdi is doing. And others uh, uh, like her, an incredible body of work is shifting. And it hasn't just come since uh, Black Lives Matter. It hasn't uh, uh, just come, uh, uh, or it's not on the back of, of any Black History Month. It's a body of work that's been going on a long, long time. I've been involved in, in, in this kind of work for about 40 years of my life. When I started to first identify, pre my probation days, but still. Um, and I think when we think about um, some of the things that we have to change, the whole education system has to be changed. How are we gonna do that with the national curriculum? I'm not quite sure. You know, the people who we think are our heroes in a British context, we have to change some of our thinking around the likes of Churchill, who caused the death of three million Bengalis. You know, he was a genesist. Beveridge, you know, architect of the welfare system, he was a eugenicist, you know? Uh, and, and many more, it was a massive movement in that time that all came from Darwinism. You know, survival of the fittest and, you know, people sitting quite comfortably, you know, if you're white, you're at the top of the pile. And if you're black and darker uh, uh, like me, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're at the bottom of the pile. Mm, why is that? I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, um, say one last thing. And on the back of this, you know, this, uh, this hierarchy of race that we've got, I mean, whatever race is. But thinking back through my life, I mean, I, I've never been a, a, um, a go-getter like Dave. Uh, um, I admire Dave. He knows that, so I've told him that personally uh, uh, off stream. I haven't had the guts what he's had to get out there and do what he's done in the private sector. I've always felt comfortable um, in, in, in the public sector because I always wanted to try and do something to, uh, um, to give back, help others to learn, uh, you know, from my experience and with my experiences. But when I think back to uh, throughout my whole working career, whether as an engineer, whether in the building trade, whether as a youth worker, uh, or as a probation uh, um, officer, or manager, middle manager, and a senior manager, I know I was good at my job. I was better than most of my peers at my job. But for most of my career, I, 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 stood, I had to stand still. I wasn't given that opportunity because, you know, along, along with the uh, uh, white privilege, when you start to challenge white privilege, there becomes a lot of fragility and people start feeling fragile. And so you have to back off a little bit or all of a sudden, because you're challenging something that is uh, um, quite destructive, you're seen as the troublemaker. So you have to back off and then you get warnings around the organization that, oh, you upset someone today. Got to remember that maybe they upset themselves. I don't know. And so it's you know this this whole thing around white privilege. We you know it's there. Hello, <laughs> whoever that is. Um, we know it's there, and we've got to stop getting scared about calling it out. And every leader in this city has got to say we have a problem in our organisation because it is in every organisation in this city and every institution. You've got to start at town hall, who's responsible for everything that happens in this city, and it has got to permeate down through everywhere. Just like you would do in an organization that has got uh, poor performance in a particular area or a number of areas, you put a strategy in place. And what happens? Performance goes up. If not, people get sacked. That's how it works. And so to challenge this, every white leader in this, in this city 
that should, should be on this conference call here. Yeah. And they should be putting their hand up and saying, this is what I am going to do from now. And they should also be saying, we know that this has been a problem for many, many, many years, um, but now is the time to change it. We'll get applauded, you know, and they'll become better leaders, but they don't realize that. That's, that's all sadness of this. Like Dave, I could go on all day, but I'll, I'll let you escape with it. Rob, thank you so much. We can we can carry on like this for hours and hours and hours. And you've made some really, really excellent points. I think everything that you've said resonates a lot with what Laura said around the idea of what what, what is counted as knowledge, what is uh, acknowledged as knowledge, what is acknowledged in the room. And I think a mark of white privilege is the ability to stay invisible, not name it, because it doesn't affect you. And so what we need to be doing is bringing these conversations to the forefront and making sure that what is happening behind closed doors is now clear for all to see. Can, can I just add, add the one? You're right. And um, this has been one of the problems. And I think, you know, it's the um, the academic world is to blame for this. Going back to what Laura said, no, what constitutes uh, uh, um, evidence? Well, I've, I'm 60 and I've lived that a, a whole life. I've gone through because my experience has not been put down in some research paper. So therefore, it's not valid. Mm. White privilege says it's not valid. Mm. But what racism does, ra ra racism actually ignores my mind, yours and everybody else's lived reality. It denies our humanity. It denies our pain when we say, ouch, that we're racist. You know? And so, yeah, we, we, we've got to change this whole approach uh, uh, to um, education and, and, and academia, because it's academia now that, that says that we're BAME. Well, I won't appreciate anybody calling me that. I don't recognize it. I barely recognize being called black because we used to belong somewhere. No, seriously, Dave, we used to belong somewhere. And that place was called Africa. We're the only people um, in this world that don't get recognized as being part of a diaspora. I'm born in Sheffield. My parents were born in Jamaica. But my four parents were born somewhere in West Africa. But I've got to get used to the term called black. Why? Because some academic. Well, I've been black, I've been coloured. I've been some names that I won't mention here. And now I'm being. No, I'm not, thank you. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and later on in, in, this, in the conference, we will be talking about data, what counts as data, what we carry as data, and also language the importance of language in situating the work that we need to do and taking care of the language that we use as well. So all of those points that you raised, we will definitely come back to. Thank you so much, Rob. And then the next question is really taking into consideration what we've been seeing over the last few months with COVID-19 and thinking about how the things that we're discussing today have been heightened by, by COVID-19. So what has been the impact of COVID-19 on Black people within the city, particularly in terms of employment. Uh, Wayne, I'm going to ask you to come in on that question, if that's OK. Um, yes, I'll just give a little context in terms of my background so people uh, understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I am a Sheffielder, as you said before, uh, and uh, my background is I grew up in Norfolk Park in Healy um, and now in a sort of more uh, leafier part of Sheffield, I suppose. Um, in terms of uh, my professional background, I'm a social worker and um, I've worked in various different areas of social work with children and families um, in mental health, child protection, um, youth offending. And I also worked previously with Rob Cottrell who gave me my big break uh, earlier on in my career. So thank you again, Rob. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I've sort of led quite a diverse professional background. Um, and personally, for me, um, one of the big things growing up was sort of race, but also class as well, given that I came from a very kind of working class background uh, in Sheffield. Um, in terms of that question and some of the other things that have been talked talked about, I mean, I've made quite a few notes. There's so much that people have said that I kind of wanted to come back on. And it's kind of wrong footed me, if I'm honest, you asking me a question about employment within Sheffield, because my um, current role now is uh, a national role. Um, so although I've worked locally, regionally um, within social work, my current role working for the um, British Association of Social Workers is national. So in terms of the impact of COVID-19, I guess I 
kind of look at it through uh, both lenses, really, both locally and nationally. And the um, the impression that I have is that um, a combination of COVID, uh, for, sorry, COVID-19 and George Floyd's death and everything else that's happened after that in terms of the resurgence of Black Lives Matter and the disproportionate effects on the Black community, all things that we know have all kind of compounded, I think, to make um, Black people feel that bit more vulnerable, really, that bit more uh, devalued. Um, and professionally, um, I'm not sure enough has been done to uh, reassure uh, Black employees of their importance uh, within organisations. Um, I do speak, obviously, from the point of your social work, because that's my domain. But that's certainly what I've observed, what I've been told, uh, what I've read, etc. Um, there's a number of articles that I've read recently that have kind of reinforced that as well. And um, some of the work that I've been involved in individually and with my organisation has really been spotlighting the lack of um, support for Black and ethnic minority social workers um, and this whole climate, I guess, has given me and my organization a kind of springboard to really kind of um, highlight some of the shortcomings within social work. But a lot of it, I think, is transferable to other professions as well. Um, so there's uh, a number of articles that I've written about anti-racism within social work, which are um, they've been published in Community Care, which is a publication specific uh, for social care and social work. Um, the first one, the first article was a bit of a rant, admittedly, because it was so close to the murder of George Floyd's death. And it just kind of ex espoused, I guess, a lot of the feeling that I felt at that time and a lot of other people uh, in my circle. Um, and the second article was more probably measured, but also kind of pragmatic in terms of outlining specific things that social work employers and educators can do um, to promote anti-racism. So it's effectively a kind of blueprint. Um, it, you know, both articles have been well received and there's a lot of um, different organizations and uh, leaders nationally that I've been uh, speaking with um, who are wanting to implement some of those practical uh, kind of, I say solutions, but I say that hesitantly really, sort of more just practical concepts and ideas that they can implement. Uh, and as I say, it's been well received. Um, Going back to the question about how black um, people have been sort of feel, you know, have they been impacted by COVID-19 and, and so on? As I say, it's all kind of compounded for me. And I think, um, you know, um, it's kind of multidimensional in that it's just another, um, it's just another issue, I think, for us to carry at this moment in time, along with the kind of rise in over racism, which is kind of, you know, kind of, um, embedded itself uh, within that uh, and of course there's the the hangover of um, the disproportionate outcomes for people of color so I think that's just a worry that especially the older generation within the black community will you know be carrying um, uh, quite harshly in many ways um, I could talk forever more uh, about anti-racism specifically but I hope that gives some insight into uh, my views on that Absolutely. Thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, Dave, can I check? Have you got your hand up for this particular question? Not for that one. I think there's something that Rob said about academia, to be honest with you. Yeah. Can I come back to that afterwards? Then? I'm gonna yeah, come yeah, to, sure, I'll, sure. I'll come to Kaltoum to respond to this question as well. Um, and then I'll come back to you, Dave. Yeah. Thank you, Mona. Um, amazing panellist. Um, I was listening to, to Professor uh, Laura and then listening to Bob, uh, Dave and, and you, uh, Wayne, and uh, all four of you, um, I will try and not bring many of my hats, but I will answer the question. Um, I was born in Somaliland and I grew up in, in, in London. I grew up in Halston, so you can imagine the kind of community I grew up with very mixed, very African Caribbean and Africans together and with Irish community. So we, you can imagine the kind of battle as a very young person that I had to uh, negotiate the system for myself and, and when I could speak English uh, and with my families and communities as well. Um, I, will, as a, I will answer some, some of the questions as, uh, as I'm the only person with a I think in the panel with a political hat on, but which is really frustrating for me because 
like you said, David, um, there are no people who look like me in the council. So that itself, I'll go back to it later. Uh, if, we, if I answer the question about the COVID-19, I think what some people really misunderstand, and I think we understand, most of us uh, who talked about racism and COVID-19 should understand is that COVID-19 didn't show us anything that we didn't know already. We, in terms of activism and campaigning and fighting for equality of communities. And I don't like BME either. So I don't really like Bammer or BME or I don't like any of these things. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Muslim black woman of African origin and uh, a British. So if people actually don't want to identify me as that, then I'm sorry, but that's who I am. Um, and I say it as it is, I don't really hide behind anything. I don't hide behind politics. I don't hide behind party politics. I am who I am, and I know who I could speak for, empower, and ask questions. In terms of COVID-19, as a counselor, um, I was one of the one of the consultants from the communities of Kala, maybe that's a word I could use, of the elected members who are in the in the um, in the council. Um, within that, we had to talk about issues to do with. Um, religious issues, so funerals and, and things like that. But to be fair, for me, I was a lot more worried about overcrowding of, uh, of the communities that we were supposed to be supporting. If we're asking people to try and self-isolate, well, it's all right if you actually got five bedroom house and you've got loads of spare rooms, but if you're placing people in a six, family of six in two bedroom house, how do you expect us to advise our communities? We haven't been used as a tool to speak to our communities but at some times it felt like that to be fair and I'm not as I said I don't hide anything it sometimes it felt like there were there were questions and there were messages being repeated by Sheffield City Council on saying please do not go to the mosque there was nothing about do not go to the church so that kind of issues are the things that um everyday battle as a, as a, as a black loan counselor, if you like, of the, the African counselor, um, the African origin counselor, I, I kind of have. Um, one of the, sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> one, of the, one of the other issue in terms of COVID-19 that I was really frustrated about is the fact that I felt and as, a, as a black woman, I felt the black community and the communities of people of color were being blamed and still are bl being blamed for having a different culture, which doesn't separate them. But to be fair, most of the women and most of the women and men are in my in Broomhill and Sharaville, but across Sheffield, who I uh, I joined the WhatsApp groups to kind of give advice, um, were already wearing face covering, whether it was the hijab or whether it was. Um, we recognize that our communities in terms of health inequalities, we recognize that we have a lot more hypertension, a lot more diabetes, a lot more because public health has not in the past. And if we go back 30 years, 10 years, you, got, you both will probably recognize health promotion was not really being targeted in our communities, but it was just a very ethnocentric, white centric promotion that didn't really help our communities. So what we're seeing is a historical systemic racism within the health uh, department or the health promotion. Um, so for me, in, that, in terms of COVID, I could talk about COVID for a very long time and actually putting COVID and racism together, it, it, it would be something that we will have to, years and years to come, think about the fact that the communities that have been neglected in the past have just been caught up. And that's why the fact the the death of our communities is really high. And that's why we're not, we don't have the antibodies and giving it to people. We're getting it from people and dying it quicker than others. And that's because there's a systemic racism. I'm gonna come back to the, uh, I think Mona, you were gonna ask me another question. <laughs> yeah, so just the barriers around tackling um, racism, what are some of the common barriers that we face? So the very first question, yeah, well, one of the one of the things that I, I, I wrote and I thought I said to Muna, I'll answer that. I'll answer the last one as well. But it looks like um, 
first of all, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I came to this, this city, lovely Sheffield city, uh, to work with uh, Professor Gina Higginbottom. You've seen Laura recognizing me. I was working with them. And actually, the reason I came here was because of health inequalities of uh, migrant communities. I did health and housing and social care inequalities with both Hallam and Sheffield University. And now being a PhD candidate, obviously that opportunity being given to me again by Sheffield University uh, School of Sociological Research means that obviously I am determined to try and use my voice uh, with the help of obviously allies and supporters. But ultimately, um, the, when we look at the barriers, let's just start with the Sheffield City Council. I'm a councillor, I need to actually give some examples. There are, first of all, the, when you look at the leadership and when you look at the senior officers, you will hardly see, even if what, few perhaps, and I don't have the number which I'm asking for, you would hardly see black officers. If you've seen them, that's because they've been in that position for a very long time and have not moved up. So for me, 15 years ago, working uh, for Fellow Interaction Sheffield as a, as a communities of color, children and young people's um, participation and development officer, I have worked with the children and young people in the city council um, uh, officers, senior officers, and I have not seen anyone who I recognize myself with. In fact, I walked into, at that time, walked into meetings where people were talking about the black community. As soon as they see me, they're like, yeah, we've got one here. And I would walk out because I don't speak for everybody. I only speak for a specific group cohort in my community. And uh, uh, those who are actually working with children and young people only. So obviously I can't represent Sadaka, I can't represent uh, different uh, other groups. So I think the barriers is not recognizing that we are valued members of our communities, but we are not a tick box. So the people need to recognize that, that you cannot tick a box as soon as somebody walks into your organization. The opportunities and the stereotypes and negative stereotypes of black people in the city needs to actually be addressed a lot better by the leaders of these organizations, including Sheffield City Council. We also need to look at, and I, I can talk about this like Dave and Rob, I can talk about <laughs> this all day wrong. But one of the other things is we need to recognize the intersectionality of our black community. So we're not just thinking about these people are black or you know people of color. There's class, there's gender, and there's ethnicity, and there's disability, and there's loads of other issues to recognize. I remember, and I'm not gonna mention names because I'm in a, in a position of, of politics at the moment. But I remember applying to organizations who are probably sitting here today, three or four times and not getting the jobs that I was overqualified for. I think many of you can actually now kind of recognize that experience. The reason being, I wasn't, I was, I, I'm outspoken. I've actually worked for some of these organizations before. I'm outspoken, but I speak for the rights of the community. And people like us are kind of pushed away and say, look, we don't want that speaks very frankly. The other barrier is something that I don't like, which is comes with the tick box and it's people. And that becomes a bit of the white privilege. And I'm sorry if it's really painful today, you have to listen. Um, it, because it's truthful, it's painful, yes, but the recognition of what we take away from today it's coming from our hearts and not just words and things that we have written on a board. It's when people actually say to you, you're a breath of fresh air. Now that is something to hide behind as part of the white privilege. Because when people say that to me, they're recognizing something in me that they recognize in themselves, which is, oh my gosh, she got here and she's a bit equal to me. But still, I'll put her in her space, place and say, um, uh, um, you're a breath of fresh air. So the other, the last bit I would say about is um, <laughs> how how do we how do we tackle this? I think every single organisation in Sheffield, and I'm so glad we've got the Commission of Racial Equality at the moment. I think many of you will recognise when Kevin speaks, but I think our leaders have been complacent for a very long time and they need to actually step back and recognize that the white privilege and the, the comfort that they have 
needs to be questioned. One last thing I would say is yesterday at full council, I did ask Sheffield City Council the, the training package of diversity with the element of racial equality is weak. I have suffered unconscious bias or whatever the, the moment people would call it. And I wonder how our few black officers would feel um, because if that is not compulsory, elected members themselves are not exempt from this. So elected members, politicians of the city need to recognize they have, the, they have to change the way they deal with communities as well. I'm gonna leave it at that because I know Mona is like, come on, Kautu. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kautu. No, again, really, really important points you raised there. And I'm just looking at the chat and I can see that Kevin O'Grady mentioned that in the discussion so far, we haven't mentioned um, Islamophobia. And I think somebody else earlier on mentioned the importance of looking at all of the isms yeah. collectively. And I think that just, it, matches what you've just said about the importance yeah. of looking at this through the lens of intersectionality yeah. when we are centering race we're talking about it because there isn't a language in the city to talk yeah. about race but when we're talking about the experiences of people who are racialized it's about recognizing that those experiences are intersectional experiences so as we talk about race we are talking about class we are talking about gender we are talking about disability we are talking about religion it's about bringing all of those conversations into the room but making sure we are centering race Race in those conversations because it is a language that has been missing in the city for so long so just to bring to everyone's attention that we may not be talking about all of the different isms and we may not be um, mentioning specific aspects of um, markers of identity that are socially constructed but they are embedded within the lived experiences and, and the things that we're discussing um, today as well. Kultum and then Dave I'll, I'll come back to you so you can follow there on very quickly, I would I would say I mean obviously um, when you become uh, when you have to pick up a political hat, everybody is kind of wary of you of what you would come up with if you're different. So my difference is actually asks questions, but at the same time I think every party, including mine in this city, have been very comfortable and very complacent not to include issues of race equality within the party politics as well. So that's another thing, politicians in the city are a lot more damaging if they're not taking the racial equality seriously. Absolutely, thank you. Dave, I'll, I'll come to you next. Most organizations that I can see have something called an equal opportunities policy, correct? They all have it, it's stated, they can show the book and everything. But yet, why is it that all these organizations, just about every single one of them, even though they've got all these policies in place, their boardrooms and their leadership look continue to look the way they do. So that's a question that these policies or these, these things, what they have, these, these pamphlets, these documents don't really mean anything. So, so I, I was in Atlanta the other day or last year and, and, and I saw something that I've never seen anywhere else in the world. And I said, and it was about, I saw people look like me doing things that I've never seen in my own city. And I would ask people, why, how did this occur? And they said, because we've got a mayor who's black and he's, one of his remits was proactive inclusion. He, he wants to make sure, and he went out to every single organization, yeah, that they positively promoted this inclusivity. And that's, I'm just wondering, if, is that the way we're going? Because it feels to me that if you leave it to the current leaders in any organization, public NHS, they're not gonna change the dial. So where do we go from here in terms of moving this thing forward so we're not here in five years, 10 years, so my kids don't have to have these same conversations in 10, 20 years. What is it gonna take? And I'm, I'm not convinced this generation of leadership are the ones who are gonna do it, you know, because why would they do it? That's my, it's a question, it's an answer. Well, that's, yeah, and, and it's a question for us to consider, but also a question that we can build onto our, the discussions later on as well, when we think about what we need to do to get to where we need to be. And yes, absolutely, there is a responsibility that leaders uh, in the city hold, the current leaders we have in the city hold, but it's also about us thinking about how we reimagine the city for how, where it needs to be. And that might mean we need to think about what does, what does leadership in the future need to look like? And what do we need to start building in right now in order to create the leaders that we need for the, for the next years that are coming 
forward um, as a city. Thank you all so much, Rob. I'm going to come to you next and then I'm going to open the floor for questions. So if you do have any questions, you can either write them in the chat or please raise your hand. So Rob, I'll come to you. Uh, it's, it's around this issue of intersectionality. I didn't want to say that twice because it's a difficult word to say. Um, but when, when we of African descent, when we talk about race, we're always talking about intersectionality. I'm not just talking about my 60 year old male self. I'm talking about my sisters, my mum. You know, we're, when, when whiteness talks about race, it's just talking about us as, as, as black people, as you call us. But, you know, it, 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 this whole thing, it, it, it permeates itself all the way through the whole canon of uh, 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 sexuality, the whole canon around disability and everything else. You know, when we talk about people with disabilities, we don't have an image of a black child in a wheelchair, for example, as one example. You know, we don't have an image of a, 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 um, a black lesbian woman. And so the, the, a conversation started between Tim and myself in, 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 in the chat, uh, because it, it's not, it's not, we can't keep talking in terms of, well, there's race, uh, and then it's also about, what about poverty? What about homosexuality? What about disability? Well, we're all of those and always have been. And this is part of the problem, you know? So, you, you know, I, I'm not saying that that race is the most important. I'm not saying that there's an, there's an hierarchy. Of, of ism, but when if, if if you are disabled, homosexual, and poor, you've got a lot of problems to deal with, you know. And when, when you're only getting dealt with as a black person, you, your problems then become more more increased. That's the point. It's not about hierarchy, but I could easily say that that race controls everything else. And I think that, you know, could reasonably be accepted, but I'm not saying that, I'm saying that we're talking about inter intersectionality all the time. And that has got to be part of this common terms of reference that we've got to agree on. Absolutely, thank you so much. Before we go on to the questions, I've got Wayne, do you want to add on to that? I'll just unmute you, one second. Thank you. I'll be very quick just because uh, I think I may need to leave very shortly anyway. But a few points I wanted to make was um, I think a lot of this is about the motivation and will for people within their organisations to actually do something about this. Um, and, you know, how, how much of a priority really it is for them. And it looks like we've got a fair few uh, prominent leaders within the city here. So my plea really would be you know, I guess uh, having that internal reflection as a leader of your organization or somebody of influence, having conversations with those within your circle, within the leadership about the kind of organizational consciousness around this and, you know, where people uh, prioritize it and recognizing the kind of fragility that Rob talked about in that, you know, everybody's on their own individual journey. Nobody kind of is kind of uh, an expert on this, but I think it's about showing uh, willing being motivated and kind of um, implementing smart, um, achievable, kind of realistic, uh, specific, uh, time limited um, uh, sort of uh, practices and behaviors that will encourage a culture within your organization to actually tackle this in a kind of incremental way, rather than um, sort of being too frightened in some ways to do the wrong thing. So not really doing anything. Um, just a couple of other final points, just about, um, I think it's important for both people, black people, people from ethnic minority communities, but also allies and the various different allies there are at different levels within organizations, being uh, educated, empowered and equipped to kind of tackle this as well. Um, and not just feeling like it's being left to black staff or staff of color, um, but actually everybody wants to get involved in kind of moving things forward. Um, and just finally, that, you know, it's really about the action. I think uh, I speak for myself, but also many other professionals I've spoken with in, in social work who have said, actually, we just want our organization to do something, to issue some sort of statement that's clear to the you know, organization what direction we want to move in. 
and then just implement uh, things on a sort of trial and error basis with a review process that's built in so it can be refined. Um, so those are the points I just want to leave you with before uh, I have to dash off and I hope some of that resonated. Wayne, thank you so much. And all of our panelists, thank you so much. We're, I'm just conscious of the time because I know that we've got to have lunch before we, we continue on with the program. So I just want to thank all of our panelists for their excellent contributions. Those of you that are wanting to ask more questions, you can still ask it in the chat function. Our panelists will still be here um, after lunch and hopefully they'll be able to respond individually um, when they pop back in and out and you do have their contact details. Those of you that haven't shared your contact details and would like to um, amongst the panel, please share it in the chat as well. So just a reminder of the program where we are going to have lunch now. Um, but when we come back, we will be having an update on the city's race equality commission by Professor Kevin Hilton. And then we will be going over some of the key things that we need to consider in in building our conversation around where we need to be as a city, um, followed by a break. And we will be concluding the session with breakout discussions, which will be action focused and solution focused on what we need to do as a city moving forward. Those of you that are members of the city's leadership, please come back for the afternoon and ensure that you're part of the conversation on how we move these uh, the things that we've discussed today forward um so i look forward to seeing all of you after lunch we will be resuming at what time at 12 40 uh, no sorry at 11 15 so lunch will be from 12 40 to 11 15 so i look forward to seeing you all then uh, just just for anyone who's not familiar with the the commission it's the the uh, sheffield race equality commission um, uh, and if anyone doesn't know me uh, th there is a, a bio on me um, uh, on the race equality commission website um, but just to let you know that I've been involved in doing work around leadership governance and equality in particular around race since 1990 and my my PhD was focused on uh, equal opportunities and policy implementation in local government. Um, and I, and, and until the um, uh, September last year, um, where, when I, uh, I stood down, I was head of the Research Centre for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion um, at Leeds Beckett University and the, the inaugural chair of the Race, Equality and Diversity Forum there. Um, I'm the independent chair of the uh, Race Equality Commission, so I don't work for the local authority. And obviously, my name uh, came across the, uh, their bows, their radar, because of the work that I've been doing elsewhere. Uh, and I'm pleased to be involved in working with, um, the, um, with Sheffielders more broadly. Now, the Commission was set up to, to uh, establish a non-partisan strategic assessment of, of the, the nature, extent and causes of, uh, um, of race inequality in the city, and importantly, to make recommendations to, to tackle them. Um, so I, I've been asked to, to give a brief update. I'm really sorry um, that I can't stick around longer. I was registered to for the first meeting where, where I had more time on that day, but this one has kind of clashes. So Muna, it's a it's a great program and hopefully we can we can talk more about how things have have, uh, have got on. So in terms of an update, we have appointed 24 commissioners. They are Sheffielders, they live in and around Sheffield. They include youth workers, housing professionals, um, uh, educationalists in the early years through to higher education, uh, a, a, a barrister, artists, community workers, health professionals, social workers and counsellors. And importantly, uh, I believe one of Kaltum is here somewhere. Hi. <laughs> so uh, uh, and so importantly, we have we have cross party support. Um, in the local authority, in the local authority, which is important, and it's going to be super important for the end game when it comes to implementing changes, not only in the local authority but amongst its key stakeholders. The commission focuses on six key areas: uh, crime and justice, health, uh, education. Um, 
civic life and communities, uh, business and employment, and sport and culture. It's operating uh, like a par parliamentary select committee, so where we'll invite key stakeholders to consider questions in relation to um, uh, 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 racial inequality and racism in Sheffield, um, to institutional approaches to related race equality duties and frameworks, um, their analysis of the cause or causes of racism and or racial inequality within their sectors. Um, importantly, we're also, we're also keen to explore where there's good practice at play because we want to communicate that to, to others. Um, so we want to look at those examples of good practice in relation to reducing racism or racial disparities. Um, and this might come from within the city, the people that we are uh, speaking to, the organisations that we're speaking to, but they, may, they might also come from uh, a broader review of what's been happening in other um, uh, large organisations, um, whether it's in the UK or, else, or, or elsewhere, if they are applicable. Um, and we would also like to find out what organisations believe would be the best way to tackle racism or racial inequality in the city. Um, so um, how can people get involved? If, you, if you're hearing about this for the first time, it's important to recognise that there is a Race Equality Commission website. So, uh, you know, go, go on to Google or Safari or your browser of choice and have a look at the Race Equality Commission website and see uh, what, we're, what we're up to. Um, there is a, there's currently an open call for evidence for indi individuals and organisations who feel they have something that they wish to share with the Commission. Um, so that evidence remains open. Uh, what we have on the website are key dates for hearings. So I would encourage um, you or, or people that you know who might be submitting evidence to, to, uh, uh, to consider where partic the particular hearings are across those six areas that I've, I've already um, uh, um, shared with you. Um, and then to, to submit before those hearings. If they miss the hearing that their, their evidence contributes to, not to worry because they'll contribute to the overall, uh, overall report. Um, now, the, the evidence can be written okay, and uploaded to the website, but it can also be recorded straight onto the website. So, uh, so that might be, you know, that might be useful for, for, for folks who, who would, well, who would just prefer to do that rather than trying to, trying to write a, a uh, a document but there is guidance on either on the website and where um where those who wish to submit have have evidence that is of uh, a, a very confidential nature and they wish to remain anonymous then there is guidance on the website on how to how they can retain their uh, anonymity the the um uh, the inbox for anybody who wishes to get in touch with me directly is it's it's one word race equality commission at sheffield.gov.uk um, we've had we've had an excellent response thus far uh, in terms of evidence uh, we already have more evidence since the call opened in August than the Fairness Commission had in its year. Uh, the, uh, the commissioners will be meeting uh, for a second time next week. <coughs> Excuse me. And the first hearing will be early in November uh, and that will be crime and justice. So, we we believe, and it's it's believed by those key people that, that were involved as the catalyst in the local authority, that the recommendations 
will lead to actions that drive systemic change. And if any of you are like me, you will retain a healthy scepticism um, for any such any such project until it until it produces. But what I hope uh, we can get from you all is, is your support and contributions and where uh, uh, you feel you would like to, to connect with me for, for whatever reason, please do that, um, as many people have done already. Um, so we're hoping to identify racism, racial disparities, get them acknowledged, get them addressed. Muna? Uh, is, is that, that, that was yes. a, an update, just an update. It's, there, there's a lot more to, to say. Um, the website uh, is there, but I, I do have a few more, a few minutes if you want to. Brilliant. Uh, thank, no, that. thank you so much. It was really helpful that you gave us an insight into how things have built up from when we first heard that the commission was being brought into the city to sit here and where, where we're at now. So thank you. We yeah. do have a couple of minutes with Kevin to, um, them to respond to any questions people have. So if you do have any questions, please just use the raise hand function and I'll unmute you. So if anybody's got any questions regarding the commission for Kevin while we have him. So Dave, I'll unmute you first. Hello, Kevin. Dave, hi, how are you? Please see you, you all right? We spoke once before, so yes. uh, good to see you in person. Kevin, um, obviously the Race Equality Commission is an important thing for Sheffield. You, you, it's, it's a, in the, about a year, I believe, that it will conclude and you'll put forward recommendations. Yes. In a nutshell, how hopeful are you, yeah? Yeah. That those recommendations yeah. will be implemented. Yeah. Out of 10, marks one to 10. <laughs> well, well, first you want me to see into the future and then give some, give marks out of 10 uh, with, with, with a level of, a, a level of foresight. Here's, here's the thing. I, I, you know, I said, I talked about healthy skepticism and there were certain questions I asked before yeah. I said I, I would, um, chair the commission. And one was what level of support do you have, um, within the local authority and what, uh, level of support do you have externally with your key partners and stakeholders? One thing I didn't, one thing I didn't say because of time was, that we already have endorsements from over 50 uh, organisations in uh, in and around Sheffield, and that and that's and by endorsing the the commission, they're actually saying that they will, that they will uh, uh, abide by the recommendations of the commission. So um, and because there's cross party uh, cross party support and the leader of the council. He, you know, and we also have we, we also have four councillors on the uh, uh, on the commission's board. I I honestly believe that we have a better chance, and I and I think it, it's a once in a, a once in a generation chance of making real and substantive change uh, uh, change around uh, uh, racism and, and racial disparities in Sheffield. So. Uh, I don't want to put a number on it. I don't want to jinx anything, but I'm really <laughs> optimistic. And for, for many people, many people would say about me that I tend to be a, um, a, a glass half full type of guy because I'm always kind of critical because I, I already know what the issues are with organizations and with, in, you know, and with individuals. I know what those issues are. I've been doing the, the, the research. I've been doing the partnership work. So I understand how things can, can trip up um because of institutional culture because of um uh because of gatekeepers because of uh uh bottlenecks glass ceilings you know the, the whole thing you know so i understand how all of those those issues can can emerge but i i am as for anyone who knows me i'm as optimistic as i can be right now because i've had a lot of a lot of support and a lot of um really useful critical observations that have emerged from the the the, the community in sheffield uh, which i welcome yeah okay cheers kev thanks very much appreciate it thank you kevin have you got time for one more uh yes all okay, right uh fidelis i'll unmeet you hi um kevin um lovely to, to to meet you and to to hear 
Um, my question is very simple. Uh, I think you, you've touched on it in, in your earlier um, presentation when you talked about healthy skepticism. So my question is this, um, what, what in your view is structurally different um, in the commission this time, because I'm, I suspect you're familiar with commissions. So what is structurally and institutionally different this time, which you think your commission is going to bring out? Um, and my sub question is, and you probably heard this in the previous conversations around comfort and discomfort when we talk about race. How comfortable or uncomfortable are you in that position leading the commission as a black person? Well, we don't really have time for, so I, I can't see who I'm speaking to. Could I get your name? Oh yes, right, Fidelis, is that right? Yes, bro. Fide okay. Uh, it's difficult for me to tell you how, how comfortable or uncomfortable I am with, with these sorts of conversations. You would need to, if you have a look at my, you know, my back catalogue of work, you'll see how consistent I have and uh, I have been in doing this work and at what levels I, I have operated. I think, I think really, you know, that will give you an indication of, of that level of comfort. And I'm, I'm quite, uh, and I'm generally, and as most of you are, I'm, I'm generally the, the, you know, that guy. You know, the guy that asked the question, the one that, has to, that, that keeps asking those, those questions. In terms of what's, what's structurally different, many local authorities, when they look at issues to do with uh, uh, race, races and racial inequalities, tend to be looking over there at what's happening over there. Let's do something about that over there. And they tend not to be reflexive. What are we doing? As soon as you turn the lens on yourself, you've got to be prepared to uh, to answer some very very difficult questions and uh, so I know that, that that Sheffield is prepared and preparing because we haven't had the the hearings yet is preparing for some very challenging and very difficult questions but so are it, its key stakeholders you know whether it's the police whether it's the uni the, the universities whether it's uh, judges uh, you know, um, uh, anchor organisations, health, you know, major, major health stakeholders, They're, they are ready to respond to those questions. And for anyone who's been involved in work around equalities, invariably organisations tend to avoid these, uh, these issues to start off with. And the way where we're going about this is we will, uh, some of the larger organisations will be asked to come in to speak to different is issues. So it, it might be, for, for example, in, in education, there might be uh, specific issues around the, uh, the, the student pipeline, um, but they may, there might also be questions in a, in a different hear hearing about uh, employment. You know, so we have a, a different uh, session on business and employment, thus allowing us to, to drill down on some very key and, and crucial issues. Um, so I, I, so what's structurally different? You have an organ, you have organisations willing to answer these challenging and very, very uncomfortable questions in some cases, but at the, um, but at the same time, where there are where there are examples of good practice that can be shared, then we'll be we'll be sharing those. I'm sorry, you've disappeared. You know how these your faces move around on. Um, so, 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 what's structurally different? I, I, you know, I, you know, I was talking to 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 um, the UK, and he'll be quite happy for me to say this. But I was talking to the UK director of Under Armour, um, who who himself is is looking at how inclusive this major international organization can be um, and for the first time he is saying his organization is willing to be reflexive and is, is doing something about it but he's been involved in the sector for over 20 years so this is a, an opportunity right now for us to be asking those questions and one thing I am doing and one thing the, commi the commission is doing is making sure that we have a, um, a really uh, dynamic comms plan that will be communicating what's be, what's happening so that people get uh, um, are kept on board 
So you won't hear from me now and then hear from me in a year's time. We'll be keeping people um, up, to, up to speed on any, any substantive issues or, or any interim findings. So, so hopefully um, you'll be able to make a, an ongoing judgment on, on how things, how things are, are moving. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kevin. I know you have to dash off, so thank you for staying longer than you originally anticipated. Uh, well, it's 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 good to see you, Muna. Can you can you uh, touch base with me uh, after the the the, 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 the the session, and maybe we can we can have a chat about yeah. how, how things went. Uh, it Absolutely. looks like a really 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 good, excellent program, and and I'm sorry, I, you know, I couldn't stay for the for the whole day. No, uh, don't worry. But uh, thank you for giving us the time. Click. I know how busy you are. And this is really helpful insight into how things are progressing with the Commission. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Um, and can you just make sure, make sure that everyone has my, my details if they wish to get in touch? Yeah, absolutely. I think Bashir, who is one of the secretariats, um, posted it onto the chat. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. No, thank you, Kevin. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. So now we're moving on. If we have a look at the programme again, uh, a, a few slight changes to timing because we went a little bit over, but we've had the update to the Commission. I want us to now just spend a few moments together thinking about how we translate everything we've spoken about this morning into actions moving forward. The rest of the afternoon is going to be action orientated, thinking about the tangible changes that, and the meaningful changes we need to make within our individual organisations and collectively as a city. Bearing in mind what Dave said and what Kevin said about the need for things to remain uncomfortable and for there to be a healthy level of scepticism. And so some of the things I'm going to draw your attention to are going to really be around the questions we need to ask within our organisations about what change looks like and how we're working and moving towards that change. I want to first of all draw your attention to this quote from the McGregor Smith Review that highlights the importance of the work that we're doing. So every person, regardless of their ethnicity or background, should be able to fulfill their potential at work. This isn't just a business case, it's a moral case. And I think when you hear the stories of lived experiences, it's easy to draw the moral argument, but sometimes we need to also consider the business case for doing the work that we're doing. And there are some real tangible changes that can be made in the city in order to improve the, the lived experiences of people of color that are working within these spaces, but also improve the city as a whole, economically and structurally. So some things that we need to consider in terms of thinking about systemic racism and where we need to, what we need to do in order to get to where we need to be. So thinking about the end in mind. It's really important to think about how we frame data. So we've had a lot of conversations in the city around the fact that there isn't a lot of data. We don't have a lot of data visibly shown from organizations around diversity, particularly around progression and around leadership and question of why those gaps in data are there. It's really important when we're doing this work to monitor the data that we have and to make sure that we're producing that data. Because if we don't have it, we can't monitor progress and we can't hold organizations to account. You can't change what you can't see. And again, when we talked about white privilege, one of the most important things about white privilege is the ability to ensure that things remain invisible. So it's about making sure that we're highlighting what is currently happening within organizations. If, those, if that data isn't publicly available and there's a lack of transparency, this inevitably results in a lack of trust. And we can see that there is a trust deficit within the city from community members to organizations. But what do we count as data? And I think it's really important for us to consider what counts as data. One of the really important things that the Racial Equality Commission is doing at the moment is considering cause of evidences that come in lots of different forms. So we're not just looking at statistical data, we're looking at data in its many forms. We also need to ask the question of what data are we choosing to collect and what data are we choosing to ignore? And this is really getting put in at the center, the need for us to take a look at intersectionality and pay attention to the fact that we are not just looking at race, but we are looking at the intersectional experience of people who are racialized. And also paying attention to the why. Why is the data being collected? And this really draws our attention to data as being purposeful. Are we collecting data to inform action that is going to be ongoing, which is what we need to be doing? Or are we collecting data in order to enable us to remain inactive? So we see lots of conversations within organizations about the need to start thinking about how we collect data and how we collect evidence. 
And there are many organizations who are using that as an excuse to not act. And so you hear people across the city saying, reports have been produced, data has been made visible years and years and years over time. What is happening with that data that we already have? What is happening with the Fairness Commission that we've already seen? And this is why there's such a lack of trust and there's a skepticism towards the Racial Equality Commission to, to a certain degree, because people don't know how that is going to translate into action. And so we need to think about how we are defining the data that we're using and thinking about why we're using that data. Is it to inform the action that is going to be ongoing or are we collecting data in order to remain inactive? To just continue having conversations, which is important, but cannot just sit on its own. Another important thing I want to raise before we go into the breakout discussions is this issue around language. And this is a reoccurring thing, particularly when you have spaces where you're bringing together people who are racialized as white and people who are as people of color, where constantly the elephant in the room is language. We need to reframe the language that we use to do this work and we need to consider language as being purposeful. There are two things that we need to consider with language. The first is what language we use to speak back to the system. So when we're talking about systemic racism, we're not able to highlight every single person's individual identity. That's not possible, but we're focusing on the ways in which that is systemic. And so we need to think about the language we use to think about the systemic nature of what we're dealing with. And then we need, when we're talking to people on an individual basis and when we're talking with communities, we need to consider language as being self-defined and language that honors the ways in which individuals and communities themselves choose to be identified. So paying attention to how we use language and making sure that that language is purposeful. Language has always been social and political and it has always changed. And so I don't think we should be worrying ourselves with the language that seems fixed at the moment because there is no such thing as fixed language. We have the ability to change the language that we use. So we need to consider what language is most appropriate for the conversations we need to have moving forward. Another thing I want to just draw your attention to as we have these conversations is a focus on what we need to do systemically to challenge the ways in which we understand the organizations that we're in. There's a real push at the moment for organizations to have unconscious bias training and unconscious bias training on its own isn't effective. It's reductive and it's simplistic because it focuses on the individual. It allows you to acknowledge the implicit biases that you hold, which is a really important part of the work that we're doing. But we have to remember that when we're tackling racial diversity, the issues are systemic. They're not just with individuals. And so if the only thing that your organization is committing to is unconscious bias, you need to think about what that means in terms of systemic change. Organizations need to examine every stage of the employment process from how individuals are recruited, how they're supported, progression, and if they're able in that environment to bring their authentic selves and fulfill their potential. We have to think about this as being systemic. And so I would really encourage you as organizations to think about the language that you're using. And yes, you can maintain unconscious bias training if you'd like to, but make a commitment to anti-racism and, and really think about what it means to create an anti-racist organization with this work. And with that in mind, I think it's important for us to consider the interventions that we're putting in place within organizations, particularly around credible progression opportunities. There are many things, including microaggressions that lead individuals in organizations to just feel like they're not the right fit, that they're not meeting the mark. And often this is very little to do with their performance. We can see a huge amount of data nationally that indicates that women of color in particular are in positions of employment that they are overqualified for. So it isn't to do with qualifications and it isn't to do with performance, but microaggressions and workplace culture makes people feel as though they don't belong in those spaces. And so it's important for organizations to think about what they're doing to create progression opportunities that are meaningful and that are credible. Whether this is a, a mentoring scheme that has been carefully designed, sponsorship, role models, creating networks, think about what your organization is delivering and make sure that what is um, challenged and what is put in place is understood at all levels of the organization and not just delivered from the top down. And finally, accountability mechanisms. It's really important to make sure that there is accountability in the work that we're doing. 
this work is systemic, which means that changing policies, changing practices, changing culture needs to contribute to the, the racial disparity that we are challenging over a long period of time. Somebody mentioned earlier on that this may not change in our lifetime. It is generational change that we are working towards. And so that change within an organization needs to be focused. There has to be somebody or there has to be a team that is responsible for overseeing this work. Who will be held accountable for ensuring that your organization has a clear action plan and is following through with that action plan? If there isn't a mechanism for accountability in your organization, this will just remain on the agenda as a conversation piece. And it won't turn into tan tangible pieces of work that needs to take place. So just to go over that one more time, we've got data, making sure that we're using and acknowledging what data is for. Language, paying attention to the language that we're using and ensuring that that language is purposeful. Thinking about why we are engaging in unconscious bias training when it, it is an individual piece of training that focuses on bias as being something that is individual rather than being systemic. Ensuring that we have credible progression opportunities and thinking really carefully about what that means for your organization and how it's going to be implemented and communicated at all levels. And accountability. Ensuring that the work remains focused and making sure that there is somebody that is ensuring that this is followed through. Accountability is hugely important. So these are just some things I'd, I'd like us to consider in the conversations that we have moving forward. But I would I do have five minutes before the breakout session. So if anybody does have any points on any of the, the things that I've raised and would like to either ask a question or reflect and ask their, add their own additional things for us to consider before we go into the breakout sessions, please do raise your hand and I'll unmute you. OK, um, one of the things I think um, and have done for a long time is organizations have in place, you know, the equalities guidelines, public sector equality um, act, etc. Everybody's aware and we have corporate documents that kind of support all this. But the key thing is accountability. And that's what's missing. You know, questions are not asked when people don't get jobs, etc. Even within their own organizations, you can do the training, but you will not progress. And I think it's that accountability mechanism that you've actually mentioned. Absolutely. And in, in your, you're right. There's a lot of things that are put in place as suggestions and are, that are put on the agenda. But again, it's not followed through. And so we go through a period where we have 10 years of it being part of the conversation. And then after 10 years, we're collecting new data that is telling us the same thing over and over again in order to put it back onto the agenda. And we need to break that cycle. And the only way to break that cycle is to ensure that there is accountability within organizations, but also thinking about what accountability we need to have as a city to ensure that that data is as transparent um, and as publicly available as it can be. Any other thoughts or reflections people want to share? Rob, I'll come to you. I guess this is one of the many $6 million questions and um, what one is, who, who decides uh, um, that I'm working to my potential in these institutions? Do I decide that? Am I punching above my weight? Or does the bias and institutional racism that individuals make up, do they decide? Um, and, the most important point that, that you raised and that, that's, that Zatoum just uh, uh, picked up on is accountability. When these institutions, these individuals who make up the institutions, when they continue not to account and, and refuse to answer questions as to why uh, uh, someone didn't get a job, uh, um, who owns them to task? How can they be held to task? They're in a very powerful position. And so the action part for me is also about us being realistic. Um, Sheffield, in, in, in some ways, it, it feels like quite a, a liberal place to me. Dave called it a liberal place, uh, um, possibly not as liberal as Nottingham as he, when he was talking. Um, but in some ways, it is liberal. But in far too many ways, it's very, very conservative. And it's, it's a place where you really can't ask questions. You know, but, you know months ago, you and I, uh, and we were having this conversation, weren't we, about who gets to ask questions? 
And who is put in a position to answer those questions? Well, there are far too many leaders in Sheffield that don't even hear the question. They don't allow question. Um, I, I saw um, um, part of the council cabinet meeting yesterday. It was, it was being televised on Sheffield Live. And the conversation was about how they are losing the, uh, the power of democracy. Who can vote for what? You know, these are the real questions and these are, are, the, are the things that we've really got to turn into actions. But, but how do we do that? Because I think one of the things that we haven't talked about much here, and it always has to be part of the agenda, is the political landscape. People like you and me, we can decide who sits in town hall if enough of our communities were politicised to vote in a way that benefits us. We can do this in London, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham. Bristol, we can do it everywhere where we are number because, you know, we're the swing vote. And I think this has to become part of the conversation that we have to start having within. And when um, a public institution um, is not being accountable, is not changing, then we demand change through the political system. But we've got to do a bit more organising around that because um, I think these are great questions and I'm, and I'm really thankful for you asking, asking me to be in part, but for me, that's the real actions that we've got to get our heads around. And people can't just come on here or any, or any other forum and just start spouting platitudes and mm. want to be all right on. Because we know that's not changing. Anything. The breakout sessions were not recorded because we wanted everybody to be as open as they possibly could be in the space. But I've recorded it now so that those that are facilitating those sessions can feed back some of the points that were raised in their individual groups. So can I ask Jamie, no, actually, I'll start with Amira first. Amira, can you feedback what your group responded to in terms of those questions? And just for ease, I'm going to put that slide back up as well. Um, so a lot of the discussions that we had was um, sort of around um, organisations gatekeeping and individuals in powerful positions not sort of uh, helping others progress within their um, workplaces. Um, we also had a lot of discussions around um, labor that individuals, particularly people of color and black people were being asked to un uh, undertake a lot of labor um, and then that not aiding them in their progression later on. Um, so lots of um, unpaid labor within their workplace, additional tasks and um, different roles that they were being asked to take on and that were pretty sort of some of them quite emotionally heavy um, and then that not sort of aiding them later on when it came when it comes to progressing um, so just lots of stuff around structural organizational and functional knowledge and um, sort of not getting the experience to be able to move on was it was a, a key point that was brought up in our discussions um, and sort of how to just progress along the career pipeline for everyone and, and not getting the support and the knowledge to be able to do that, but then also acknowledging some of the organizational and structural issues that um, are blocking that as well. Great, thank you. Do you want to go through the other two questions as well and then we'll move on to the other groups? Yes, no problem. Um, so as we can see the second question, uh, what needs to be done to tackle racism systemically and in terms of workplace culture? Um, one of the first sort of key points that came up in our group was sort of the emotional and physical toll um, that systemic racism can have on individuals that we don't often, I think, get to hear enough about. Um, some of that really, some of the damage that that does um, sort of being on the receiving end of that. Um, we also had some of our members talked about not wanting to be seen as pulling the race card um, and sort of where that derives from. Um, and how uncomfortable still um, in 2020, um, even with the sort of the reawakening to systemic racism globally that we're seeing, that how uncomfortable it, of an issue it is still to talk about. Um, we also then talked about sort of the need for training, education and awareness when it comes to tackling systemic racism um, and workplace cultures. Um, and I think one of the other things that was really important was that we're not here to debate the existence of systemic racism, particularly in different workplace cultures. Um, I wouldn't imagine that anybody that turned up to uh, this session today um, would be here to debate that issue. So I think it's really important that we start from that place that we don't want to argue against the experience, the lived experiences of people. Um, and we also, in terms of what can be done, um, we discussed the need for mechanisms. Um, some of our 
members in, in my group talked about um, reverse mentoring that's going on in their particular workplaces um, for people of color and black people um, to help them progress in their careers. Um, and another key thing that we discussed was the need for people in positions of power to, um, I think it was Tom in our group that also talked about in terms of where is your capacity to contribute to tackling systemic racism in your role at work um, and personally as well. And I think for me linked to that question of where's your capacity for this work is also what are you willing to give up um, in your positions of power and privilege. Lovely. And then the final question, um, we had really lovely lengthy discussions, so we didn't uh, get to delve into this one as much, but um, in terms of what would be some achievable outcomes that we can work towards as a city, um, one of them was to sort of um, help to connect all the different organizations within the city and see which approaches are successful, which approaches are having really great outcomes and sort of implement that more widely across various organizations. So just to have sort of a hub in which people can feed into and also take out of equally. Um, and then also some sort of development pipeline to see how, what the how to pr uh, monitor progress in um, how to sort of, uh, to just monitor progress of the work that's being done um, and collaboration as well equally, just we want more work done in the spirit of collaboration and working together. Absolutely, thank you so much Amira. There's really, really thorough discussions on each of the different areas. Uh, Jamie, can I come to you next? We had a very fruitful discussion. Uh, there's no particular order in which I'm going to read out the responses. So some of them may be connected to the early ones that I, that I mentioned. So first of all, um, the barriers of progression in the workplace. So culture of leadership, not having awareness of the wealth that people coming from African, Asian, other minoritized groups bring to the organization. Um, lack of belief, which links to sort of, you know, racial ideologies amongst people in, in organizations, senior citizens organizations who don't actually believe that people coming from different backgrounds can contribute any value. So that comes to, you know, a lack of education and a serious sort of fundamental um, reprogramming um, aspect. Um, lack of accountability in organizations. So that there's just simply a lack of accountability that looks at the progression routes um, for people coming from uh, minoritized groups. Um, training and development was also highlighted. There's a lack of meaningful engagement with employees um, that, that's quite widespread. Um, not acting on employee feedback. So we had some quite honest, open discussions um, around and, and, uh, organizations and the fact that, you know, some, some admitted that, you know, there's no acting on the employee feedback. Um, lack of examples of people coming from African, Asian, other minoritized groups in senior positions. I think this has been highlighted earlier on today as well. But at the same time, it's not just about faces in places, um, just because we're going to have, you know, more representation of um, people in, from, coming from those backgrounds in an organization doesn't necessarily solve the problem um, of systematic racism. Um, it comes a lot down to who you know. So a lot of organizations have quite a clicky culture within them. And if you don't, if your face doesn't fit in that, in that click, you just simply don't progress. You know, um, a lot of people coming from African, Asian, and minoritized groups, you know, it's not necessarily in our culture to sort of go out drinking and, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of the, the colleagues and organizations, you know, they're, they're drinking buddies and a lot of the, you know, political things of the organization are discussed around that drinking table. But for some people's culture, it just doesn't fit. And because you're not part of that, you know, dominant culture, you 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 set you tend to sort of miss out. Um, fear of discussions around race, senior leaders not understanding issues around race, um, the fear of becoming a trouble causer if you raise things around race. I think this is quite dominant. You know, there's, there's a deafening silence amongst all of these things, and you know, the fact that people have got bills to pay and they're reliant upon the the, the salary in, from the organisation, things are not being raised. Uh, recruitment policies. Um, there's a lack of honesty in, in organizations, uh, lack of awareness of right of white privilege and dominant culture. Um, and there's not, a, there's not enough strong leadership. So leadership is quite happy to maintain the status quo because why it's not affecting the organization. It seems to them it doesn't affect their children, their, their kids coming through the system or, or their peers, children and whatnot. So there's a, there's a, 
a lack of urgency to do anything about it. Um, there are gatekeepers who simply are there to sort of maintain that systematic thing. You know, again, no no accountability, um, and there's a lack of authenticity being recognised and facilitated. So I think going back to the ability to understand how actually when you leverage different cultures within the organization, the wealth coming from them, your organization can prosper, but there's no recognition and there's no facilitation of that taking place within organizations. So all of these prevent uh, progression in the workplace. Because of the lack of time, we discussed the final two questions and I asked the participants to combine their answers together. So going through those, um, education is absolutely key. Um, the, the, there's a lack of education, particularly at a senior level. You know, you've got organizations with senior executives who have a, a real lack of understanding on the issues around race, which then prevents them from making any sort of strategic objectives that can address issues around race that can filter down into the operational level of organizations. So education is absolutely key. Um, being able to have systems that can recognize um, uh, pr progressive work in this area is also key. Um, desire to change. There has to be a desire to change. And, and the fact is that if the desire to change is not there, nothing gets done. You know, I work, I've, I've seen in organizations when there's a desire to do something, it gets steamrolled through. And I think, you know, we've heard today how from a historic perspective, this thing around race has been here for years and dec decades. But yet there's still no real change, which means there's still a lack of desire to change. So hopefully we can change that moving forward. Um, government policy has to change, and this has to filter down into organisations to start that accountability. Um, having charters and, and accountability around those charters. Um, when there needs to be systematic way of recognising how we can establish where an organisation is at in regards to its race and its policies. So establishing, if you like, the as-is position of, of where they are and being quite open and honest about that. Um, sharing of good practice uh, needs to be done. So facilitating that, I think there was a mention of having hubs earlier on, which I think is a good idea, how we can meaningfully share practice and roll that out in, into the areas of the city. Um, there has to be genuine buy-in, culture shift, um, people giving time to change, um, we had proactive inclusion, I know these are quite generic. More engagement with the communities. Um, there's a lack of engagement. There's no, there's, there needs to be more meaningful engagement with the communities. Um, and the, yeah, they were the main things that I think, and if I miss anything, anybody can raise their hand in our, in our group and, and add to that. But I, that's what I sort of noted down from our group, Mona. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. I can see Jonathan's hand up. Do you want to add something to that? Uh, I was just going to add to that is, is safe spaces for people to have those discussions. Um, I think that's very important that there is a bit of an Excel subject. So some people don't want to have that discussion because they feel like they might be demonized as a bit of a trouble cause. Or there's some people that don't want to have that conversation because they feel like they might get it wrong. So creating safe spaces for both. So people don't feel like, you know, they're a trouble cause or they're using any sort of race cause. And people don't feel like, okay, if I get it wrong, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly some sort of racist. No, it's, it's about having, you know, just creating a safe space. So I thought that was important. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and thanks, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. A really important point. Um, I've had conversations with people in the room. I think most people will know that I'm not a huge advocate for the idea of a safe space, especially when we're talking about race, because it's, um, it's virtually impossible to create a space for everybody in the room that is going to be safe because we have intersectional lived experiences. But I completely agree with you, Jonathan, that we need to create spaces that are respectful and that enable these conversations to take place. Nusraf, um, can I come to you next? And then I'll come to Amira. I know we're really, really short on time, so please thank, thank you all for your patience. So hi, so yeah. So um, in response to these three questions, uh, so we were talking about how different people experience racism and discrimination differently, even if on paper we have the same characteristics or tick the same boxes. Um, and yeah, so we, we spoke about racism is about power, maintaining the status quo of one group being superior to, to the other. Uh, it wasn't just um, someone calling you a rude name, but it, that racism is a structure and that it has to be 
dismantled and how is was the last thing so yes so what else yes so we said uh, about people dying uh, of COVID-19 because of the culmination of years of restricted access to health care being placed in shoddy housing and working precarious jobs that, di that didn't give them the luxury of adequate pay or going on furlough or working from home. Uh, then, yes, then racial disparities also exist in universities, the awarding gap across the country that shows students from Black, Asian or Arab backgrounds are less likely to achieve a 2-1 or first than their white counterparts. So this can determine their future. Um, oops, yeah. And this gap has widened in some of the universities. So the graduates are also less likely to go into jobs in the same field they studied and are significant, significantly less likely to start on the same salary as their counterparts. Um, yeah, so this, that's one thing. So we, the second question was, what would be, what would be, what would, what would, yeah, so the second question, so uh, we, we said, uh, so Angela Davis said that radical, si radical simply means grasping things at the root. And we were talking about how our approach to changing culture must be radical. So the impact of it is long lasting. Uh, so we were talking of, um, they spoke of, we were speaking of uh, trainings, you know, diversity uh, and inclusion trainings. Uh, and obviously unconscious, uh, unconscious bias. Uh, you know, whether it's intention, uh, you know, knowing or unknowing unconscious bias. So how do you, how do you educate people? Because are people, uh, you know, are they, some people are actually some, some one person suggested that some people, uh, you know, they don't on purpose, they don't uh, do things, but they have to be given uh, some sort of education because people understand that there is, there is an issue, but they don't really, you know, they, they talk of developing structures, but they don't really understand what racism is. So they need to first understand people, their cultures. So that was one thing that they, they mentioned and they mentioned recruitment, how old fashioned recruitment is, and that uh, there's lack of progress, uh, the data and the research out there most of them are biased or, or not very correct so that has to be worked on because it doesn't really include the ethnic minorities and really understanding them in depth um, so and about diversifying opportunities uh, you know without stereotype stereotyping professions like certain professions are people think are meant only for certain people and not for everyone uh, so, yes, so how do we tackle that? And then, yes, so they spoke about race equality opportunity, understanding it, that most people at the bottom understand it, but not the people who are at the top, the decision makers. So is there equality there? Is like, you know, the directors or the top people, the decision makers, are there, are there, is there a diverse group there? Or is it just uh, only, one ethnicity, uh, you know, one group of people who are making all the decisions for everyone. So, yeah, so uh, that was... Uh, then making it a standing item in the agenda, uh, you know, like uh, diversifying, uh, diversifying the curriculum, then the, and the workplace, to make it a standing item and then to celebrate people who have uh, who have achieved something not just not just citywide but nationally so that more people will feel inspired and motivated by this so it was about um, so it was about changing the system uh, yeah so it was about changing the system basically saying to dismantle the system yeah so that's pretty much yeah there's more but <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's about Brilliant. it thank, thank you thank you so much Nusra. Um, again, yeah. another oh sorry one 
if there's anyone else who would like to contribute from my group because they were amazing honestly we had like an amazing conversation there's so much here i'm just picking out uh, uh, you know picking a few things but if anyone likes to contribute and if muna thinks uh, there's time yeah yeah we'll we'll, we'll we'll definitely make time if, if members of the group feel as though they want to contribute more but that was a really i feel like a comprehensive summary of what was discussed with, with, and it was a really really rich discussion thank you so much I think we're just finishing off next with Alex, your group. Yeah, thanks, Muna. Um, quite similar conversations to what's already been said, so I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, really, really rich stuff um, around kind of that cultural environment. Um, people talking about those informal networks, again, how opportunities are often um, extended through those kind of uh, chats uh, at the pub or elsewhere. And if you're not part of that inner circle, then you're unable to kind of find out that opportunity. Um, so that was seen as one of the major barriers. Also around um, recruitment, which we've already mentioned, but the fact that um, there's, there's a lack of transparency around uh, the policies around recruitment, the practices of recruitment, how decisions get made. Uh, many people coming with great CVs and applications, but somehow not getting the job. Um, that was a real issue. Um, an unwillingness to self-reflect amongst um, white people, particularly white leadership, because of their um, contentment, I suppose, with the status quo. That was another huge issue. Um, a lack of uh, awareness about historical scope. So whilst it's important to think about how uh, we, the particular situation of COVID, it's also important to recognise that this is a historic problem that's been going on for centuries and that this is the latest manifestation and uh, being aware that change, therefore, is not going to come uh, immediately um, and that kind of lack of long-term investment from particularly white leaders is, is, a, is a real problem as well. Um, I think that kind of covers the main things because, because other speakers have already summarized barriers. In terms of like what needs to be done to tackle racism, uh, people mentioned readdressing the education system um, and really also when we're addressing structural change, acknowledging that there are different institutions that um, operate differently. So the education system will work differently to the council and both need to be, um, to be fully interrogated um, and treated um, as different entities that nevertheless are underpinned by the same issue of structural racism. Um, we talked about the need for safe mechanisms um, whereby uh, those who kind of maintain the status quo, uh, enforce racism, both formally and informally, could be held to account without then jeopardizing um, people in quite precarious positions. So, how do we establish these safe mechanisms um, for holding those leaders accountable? Um, addressing issues around representation and leadership. Uh, it's already been commented upon, like the statistics around leadership in the city. Uh, how do we go about that within the council um, as one specific example, but also generally in organizations, uh, we need to directly target who's in those higher positions. Uh, and in terms of talking about tangible outcomes uh, now, taking it up from 4% to meet, making it meet that more 20, 25% as a minimum is something that we can be trying to achieve. Um, and yet engage, we talked a lot about the council actually and kind of the need to engage the council, but also recognizing that due to kind of the historical behavior of the council, there may be another different routes that need to be identified as well. We may need to bring more solutions to the council um, and not rely on, on that leadership. So, but definitely a collaboration with the council was seen as being important. Um, access for conversations, difficult conversations like the ones we're having here um, amongst all of us who are involved in the workplace, leadership positions um, and staff as, and staff in those um, other work positions as well. Um, and I think as well, we've always said this, but that investment amongst white leaders 
um, the need to have the will to make change, um, that was seen as being quite key. Uh, and and it's, it, to, to facilitate that, to engage that, it's, we're going to require more than unconscious bias training. It needs something much more holistic. Um, and trying to discover different ways of engaging people was also foregrounded. So what works for one person, what engages one person might not another. Um, so can we think of a more holistic way to spread the message um, about what we're talking about today? Uh, I'm trying to just uh, summarize my notes. I think that's the main things. If anyone else, as we've been saying, wants to kind of add to that, please feel free. But I think that's the main stuff. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you to all of you who facilitated the, the breakout sessions and, and fed back those rich responses. It's clear that everybody has recognised the need for this to be something that is systemic and a discussion that goes beyond changing organisational culture to thinking about how do we actually turn this into something that is a collaborative and a collective effort um, across the city.